The first item on the agenda is the executive director's report. Mr. Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Good afternoon. Um, I have a couple of announcements. Uh, I'm very excited to hear from our panel discussion today. Um, we, this morning, a couple of the folks on the panel, Dr. Marvin and Dr. Holman, were in the legislature and testified to two committees, House Health Care and Senate Health and Welfare, on the workforce issues surrounding primary care. Um, and it was a really wonderful discussion. So this is just going to be a broader uh, focus with different uh, folks from different sectors of education and other providers. I have an announcement in terms of the uh, schedule for next week. We will be hearing um, from Vital and Diva an update on their budget. And um, I think that's, oh, I, I will, I've announced this a couple of times, but today is January 15th. For folks in the legislature and folks who work in state government, this is a day that we typically have lots of legislative <laughs> reports to. So we uh, submitted our annual report actually yesterday, and we have a primary care spend report that is going to be submitted today. And all of those reports are on our website. And that's all I have to report. Thank you, Susan. The next item are the minutes of Wednesday, January 8th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, January 8th without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No one abstention. No one abstention due to an absence. Okay. We're now going to um, turn to the purpose of today's meeting. And uh, before I get started with kicking off the panel, I wanted to um, recognize some legislators who are in the room. Um, unfortunately, I don't always recognize all of them, and I apologize for that in advance. Um, one of the members I readily see is a former colleague of mine from Mondays in the legislature. Um, the Chair of House Commerce, Mike Marcotte, who has been laser focused on the issues of workforce for the last couple of years, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to make some huge progress this year. I also see um, a former member of the Green Mountain Care Nominating Board, a member of the legislature, an economist, um, Bob Bancroft, so welcome. And Mike, if you could help me with whoever I missed. Sure. Um I have two other committee members that are here right now. Um, Representative Jim Carroll from Bennington and Representative Zach Ralph from the Windsor area. Welcome all. We love to have legislators here. Um, you're such an important piece as we try to uh, solve the uh, workforce crisis in the state. And we know that it transcends health care that's across all sectors of the economy, but the point that we often try to reinforce from the uh, board's perspective is that in the case of health care, um, we could be jeopardizing the quality of care, or um, it gets paid for regardless because hospitals can't turn away um, patients, and so they're often in the position of paying at least twice as much as they would if they had an employed individual for travelers and locums. Um, the focus today is on one narrow focus, which is primary care. And um, so we're not going to get into any of the other uh, shortages across the healthcare spectrum, but we did want to uh, put the focus on primary care. And in 2016, Act 113 um, established the uh, Primary Care Advisory Group, and that group was slated to uh, sunset in July of 18. Recognizing the uh, great input and um, the value of the primary care, uh, group. The board itself um, set it up as uh, a task uh, group that we're entitled to set up under statute under Act 48 and have continued to uh, receive valued um, input, feedback, and advice from, from the group. 
This year, that group has identified the uh, workforce um, as its main priority. And as Susan said, um, several providers testified this morning in both the House and the Senate and uh, talked about the shortage of primary care doctors in Vermont. And one of the reasons uh, people ask, why are we focusing on one segment? And I just want to point out that we could have a panel on each and every segment, but the focus for today is on primary care because if you take a look at what is central to health reform efforts in the state of Vermont, primary care is front and center. And we know if we can get people in front of primary care providers, we're gonna have savings over the long run. And if you take a look at other countries in the world, developed countries that are delivering better health outcomes at a much cheaper cost, the main difference is that in those countries, there are two primary care providers for every one specialist. And in the United States, we have it exactly backwards. We have two specialists for each primary care doctor. And despite all our efforts in primary care, the legislature and the administration have put additional funds into uh, primary care reimbursement in Medicaid, and uh, One Care has put a huge focus on primary care in the Alpera model. Um, at times we feel like we're taking two steps forward, but three backwards. And if you look at recent data, the uh, physician's report notes that 25% of Vermont's physicians worked mainly in primary care, and of that, only 12% worked in family practice. Also, in seven of the 14 Vermont counties, at least 41% of the primary care physicians were over age 60. And as we all get older, we know the demographics, we're not gonna need less care, we're gonna need more care. And so this is uh, quite alarming. So this panel has been put together to discuss Vermont's primary care issues and the need for timely solutions. And there are a lot of small pieces that could be done and there are some large pieces that could be done. But what we've asked this panel that's been assembled here today is not just to talk about the problems, but also to discuss some possible solutions. So joining us today in this really high level panel, and uh, Joe, I think that um, Susan is, is ecstatic because you're the only male. <laughs> I'm Rose among the four. I actually think I need to take a picture of this panel. Yeah, I but on the panel, we're very, um, very fortunate to have uh, Elizabeth Cody from the Director of the Office of Primary Care and AHEC Program, the Larner College of Medicine, UVM. We have Catherine Becker Van Hayes, Director of Health Policy and Health Veterans and Business Outreach at Senator Bernie Sanders' office. I tried to get her to tell me what was said between uh, Bernie and Elizabeth okay. last night. <laughs> she wouldn't offer that forward. <laughs> We welcome Jessup Arnott, the Executive Director of the Vermont Medical Society. We have Helen Leighton, the Vermont Director of Public Policy at Bi State. We have Dr. Joe Haddock from the Thomas Chittenden Health Center, who is also a member of the board at One Care Vermont. We have Dr. Krista Zela, Interim Senior Associate Dean for Medical Education at the Lyon College of Medicine at UVM. We have Dr. Kathleen Moreau, Department Chair, Community and Family Medicine, Geisel School of Medicine and Dartmouth Hitchcock. So we have the two main <coughs> suppliers of doctors in our career. <coughs> we have Dr. Faye Holman, Green Mountain Care Board of Primary Care Advisory Group members and a member of the Little Rivers practice. And we have Dr. Katie Marvin, also from the Primary Care Advisory Group and from the Community Health Services of Lamoille Valley. So welcome to all our panelists. And what we ask is for each one to take approximately five minutes. There's no egg timer, so don't feel that you either have to take the full five or that we're going to cut you off because we will not, unless you keep going on and on and on. <laughs> <laughs> so we are going to start with um, Liz Cook. Liz. Hi. Thank you uh, for this opportunity to participate in this panel. Um, I'm Liz Cook. I'm the Director of Primary Care Advisory Group AHEC. Um, AHEC is a statewide network of free organizations dedicated to health workforce development. We work with many partners and collaborators. 
Our aim is healthy Vermonters, and we contribute to this through health workforce development. Um, by inspiring young people to pursue health careers, supporting health profession students and trainees, and by administering an incentive programs and serving um, as a continuing education resource for the current workforce. I've provided slides about AHEC and data from our programs, including data about educational learning payment and scholarship incentives. Today's assignment is to present ideas about uh, working towards solving Vermont's workforce challenges um, and presenting these ideas very quickly. <laughs> Action area one, language. Language matters. With all due respect, let's consider reframing the narrative and rein in our use of the word crisis. Sometimes there are actual workforce crises, but we tend to use it to describe our state of being. It does not help. It does not allow for clear, open-minded, creative thinking, analysis, and thoughtful action. Who wants to pursue a career in a field or specialty in crisis? Who wants to live or work in a place in crisis? Instead, can we accept workforce development as a challenge for the long haul and broaden our approaches? Diligence is needed in how we talk about these challenges matter. Action area two, collaborative action network. Vermont needs a highly functioning multi-sector healthcare workforce development collaborative action network. This would allow us to connect the dots between organizations, activities, and leverage resources and data toward a shared vision and collective impact. The concept has been tried before and fallen flat. It's easier said than done. We need to revision, reconstitute, re-engage, recognize and respect that authentic collaboration takes time, it's hard work, and it's valuable. We need a strategic plan and a work plan that is actually implemented and monitored. We need a variety of efforts to demonstrate and communicate that Vermont is a great place to live and work. Action area three, get comfortable with the uncomfortable, data and behavioral economics. Conventional wisdom is not necessarily true. We cannot ignore inconvenient data. Longitudinal outcomes data are necessary to gauge pro program effectiveness and impact. Workforce development is complex and there's a tendency to oversimplify. Personal and unconscious biases hinder us. The methods by which education, career pathways, and employment decisions come to fruition are complicated, often are un an unknowable combination of factors and values. An example. AHEC endorses the need for educational loan payment and scholarships. It's necessary, it's baseline for us to be competitive nationally. With that said, these tools tend to receive a disproportionate amount of attention and energy when it comes to implementing workforce solutions. Educational debt is a factor, but it is not necessarily the most important factor for a large segment of the physician workforce pipeline. Factors vary in degrees from person to person, but we need to listen to the trainees about what's most important to them and ensure we're responding strategically. Looking at the 2019 national data from the Association of American Medical Colleges, there's information in the link in the slides I've provided. There are data from a, a survey of about 16,000 um, medical school graduates. One of the questions is, how influential were the following in helping you decide your specialty? We're thinking about primary care here. Strongest influencer, fit with personality, interests, and skills. 87% strong influence. Content of the specialty, 83% said that was a strong influencer. Role model influence, 51% said that was a strong influencer. Work-life balance. 43% strong influencer. Income expectations, 15% said that was a strong influencer. Level of educational debt, 7% said that was a strong influencer. 55% said it had no influence at all on their specialty choice. Another question from that same survey. How useful were the following resources in learning about specialty choice and career planning? The top two responses 
Advising and mentoring, 47% said that was the most important um, or very useful. And participating in in-house extracurricular electives so they can explore, 44% said that that was very helpful in those decisions. Are Vermont strategies inclusive of the largest segments of the workforce pipeline? Question. When introduced to these data, I did not fully believe. But as I continue to look at the data and track it over time, it continues to echo these similar statistics. Um, monitoring these data will be informative as medical student demographics change over time. Action area four, listen and adjust. UVM and AHEC are using these data and other data to inform programming. We implemented the new and evolving Vermont AHEC Scholars Program starting the class in 2022 to provide enhanced opportunity to delve deeper into areas such as social determinants of health, practice transformation, diversity and cultural intelligence, interprofessional engagement, data and systems. Working with the Office of Medical Student Education and the Department of Family Medicine, we're enhancing mentoring and facilitating role model opportunities, again, based on the feedback that we're receiving. If, if a practice would like to serve as a clinical preceptor site for medical students, let me or Dr. Zale know. If you live outside Chittenden County and are interested in providing volunteer housing for up to five weeks while a medical student is enrolled in a clinical rotation and experiencing a different Vermont community and future employer, let me know and I'll connect you with the right people. We strive to understand what these students and professionals value most. It changes over time, from baby boomers versus millennials. Well, only 7% of medical student graduates said that educational debt is a strong influencer on specialty selection. Our workforce development tools, scholarships and loan repayment, focus on solving that perceived problem. 55% said that educational debt had no influence on specialty selection. What are we going to do to entice that larger pool of 55%? Are our resources and energy misaligned? I don't know, but it seems worthy of further discussion and exploration. Action area five, look inward first. This includes some anecdotal information. It is beneficial for each organization to look inward about what they do to attract and retain its workforce. Why would somebody want to work at your organization? What is the culture? How is the morale? Do all employees feel supported? You can't focus only on the clinical staff. Do you make the most of your interactions with medical students when you have that opportunity? This is similar to self-help books where the advice is obvious not new, it sounds ridiculously basic. The problem is that while we know, we're not actually doing. In the work that AHEC does with physician placement, loan repayment, recruitment, and retention, we are privy to personal stories and anecdotal information. Granted, we usually hear from folks when things are not going well, and less so when things are going well. But drawing on 15 years of working with physicians as they make employment decisions, that storytelling is rarely about a better compensation package or about a better loan repayment deal. When things are not working out, people want out, a sample of the recurring themes we hear are in the recruitment and interview process. Personality does not gel, vibe is not right, people seem unhappy or cranky. Facility issues, it's outdated, it's poorly decorated, you need a repair, it's messy. These are real things. <laughs> During the interview process, feedback that we heard that was a turnoff, the food that was served at the, during the interview process, the way people were dressed at the interview, um, other feedback during the recruitment process, the, the practices behind the times, they're still using paper records, general fit wasn't <laughs> right, there was a lack of follow-up or delayed follow-up after the interview process, and, um, that's, and we also hear family needs and spousal employment in that conversation. Awesome. Retention. Uh, during the retention process, somebody's already working at a place and now they want to, to change. Um, and they're, they're talking with us, either looking for a different position or trying to um, uh, get out of, get released from a, a service obligation, loan payment service obligation. We hear the problems being 
workplace culture, toxic environment, mismanagement, personality and relationship issues. I do not have a voice. I do not feel supported. Clinical safety, clinical quality. I can't practice the way I want. Inadequate time for patient, with patients. General burnout, stress, not enough time. Administrative processes related, death by paper. Complaints about technology and electronic medical records are usually rolled in there. Um, a lack of specialty support and referral resources. I'm not feeling that they can do their jobs well. Um, and then family needs come up in that conversation often as well. In closing, recruitment and retention tools, such as educational loan repayment, are necessary, but at the same time, they have limitations. We need a variety of sustainable interventions and tools starting with K-12 students. A coordinated federal, state, local, public, private, academic, all hands on deck, skin in the game approach is my professional recommendation. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for having me here today uh, to share a federal perspective on this issue. Um, if it makes you feel better or worse, Vermont is not the only state in the nation experiencing this challenge. Um, there are a number of federal programs that are specifically designed to help address the workforce challenges facing our country today. The demographic challenges that Vermont is facing, uh, we are one of the oldest, grayest states in the country, but our entire country is graying and is experiencing a greater need for healthcare services. Um, a number of pro there's a, a number of programs that I think actually a lot of people don't know about or they know about, but only to a limited degree. So I'm just gonna quickly mention a few. Um, Number one is graduate medical education, which is the vast majority of federal funding to go towards workforce in the healthcare field is for graduate medical education. 78% of all federal funding for healthcare workforce is in the GME program. Um, most people think of graduate medical education is coming from the Medicare program. That is the vast majority of it. 45 states, including Vermont, do help provide GME funding through the Medicaid program. Here in Vermont, $13 million goes towards GME from Medicaid, which yields a federal match of $17 million. Um, according to a recent report by the Government Accountability Office, which is part of the legislative branch of the federal government, um, the data provided from the state of Vermont to GAO showed that one FTE resident was funded with Medicaid GME dollars. So $13 million of Medicaid funding from the state of Vermont, $17 million match from uh, the federal government, and one FTE resident funded through that program. Um, the funding goes to support a number of other activities, uh, but that was the data provided from the state of Vermont to GAO. Um, some Medicaid graduate medical education funding in certain states is limited to primary care. Um, Alabama, Montana, New Mexico, and South Dakota have made that decision within their Medicaid program to limit GME funding to primary care. Um, so that is something that is available to states. Um, also, it is worth saying, I think, that with GME funding from Medicare, um, there is no requirement or limitation to how that funding is used based on the workforce needs of a particular region or as a nation as a whole. Um, other programs like what is done through the Department of Defense medical education programs, they actually look at their population, they look at their population of providers, they look at the need of the, their patient population, and they fund graduate education and medical education based on what the need for certain provider types is. Um, that is not how it's done in the GME program. Um, another program I want to mention is the National Health Service Corps. Um, the National Health Service Corps is probably not particularly well known in Vermont. We do have a couple of federally qualified health centers with National Health Service Corps members serving at them. Um, the way the National Health Service Corps works is you 
have a score based on the region of the country you live in. Um, there's a bunch of stuff that goes into that score. It has to do with um, how far you are from another provider, uh, your provider to patient ratio, and the federal government determines your score, which is a, called a HIPSA, or a Health Professional Shortage Area. And based on your score, which is as good as a zero, as bad as a 25 or 26, that qualifies you to leverage funding from the federal government through the National Health Service Corps. The location becomes a approved location and then an applicant can go work at that location. Um, right now, through FY19, funding for the National Health Service Corps is $319 million. Uh, that money has funded a small fraction of health professional shortage areas. So what it means is that there are a number of regions in the country and in Vermont who qualify under this program, but because Congress has provided insufficient funding, those regions aren't able to actually leverage a person to come work with them. So in Vermont right now, we have 16 sites that have a HIPSA score of 16 or higher, meaning we can actually leverage a person um, I should note also that of those 16 HIPSA scores, um, all of them are for mental health. Every single one of those 16 where we qualify as in the greatest needs are in mental health. They're not in physical primary care and they're actually surprisingly not in dental care either, though we have an additional 44 locations that would qualify if Congress provided sufficient funding. Um, so that is one place where, from Senator Sanders' perspective, significant federal investment could make a real difference because we know that we have people who want to come work in those sites. I think we often hear a narrative that providers don't want to work in rural areas. Right now, um, according to the Association for the Clinicians for the Underserved, only 40% of loan repayment applicants have a place that if they are approved to go work. So there's another 60% of providers out there who have signed up and said, I want to be in the National Health Service Corps, I want to go work in a rural or underserved community, and we have no place to put them, again, because Congress has not provided sufficient funding. There is also a scholarship component to the National Health Service Corps, and of those applicants, only 10% are placed. So there are people out there who want to work in these areas, and we have the areas identified. So from the federal perspective, um, my boss believes, and I believe that this is a place where sufficient, more significant federal investment is needed. Um, so with the work of Congress, this is actually something that I think the federal government can really help the state of Vermont to achieve. Um, there is also the Public Health Service Corps, which is different from the National Health Service Corps, but can also help provide providers in certain underserved areas and certain provider types. Um, I will just briefly uh, mention, I think a lot of Senator Sanders' approach to this work is pretty well known. Um, he obviously is uh, the author of Medicare for All legislation in the U.S. Senate over the past number of years, um, which does define health care as a human right to all people, um, and as such um, would allow for more people to access primary care. Um, he also has worked to expand federally qualified health centers, the National Health Service Corps, which I just spoke about, and teaching health centers. All of these are focused on primary care to sort of get upstream at a lot of the clinical challenges our specialty providers are seeing today. Um, with support from Congress, we are working to greatly expand those programs. Bernie wants to double the number of patients who could be seeing at a federally qualified health center. Um, he also supports, and I think this is important to mention in this discussion, is College for All. Um, the Senator's College for All legislation in the Senate is focused on undergraduate education, but we believe that by making undergraduate education free at four-year public institutions, it does allow more people to enter and receive an undergraduate degree and go on without debt to pursue specialized education. Um, we've also worked significantly um, through the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program, which is in law. Um, 
talking to Liz earlier, there's a lot of challenges with that program, but it's out there and it can work. Um, and I would just do a little PSA plug for um, our casework team. Uh, the Senator employs five members of our staff in Vermont whose sole job it is to help Vermonters deal with the federal government. Um, we wish it, they didn't need to do this work, but they do, and we can help people navigate the public service loan forgiveness program. So to the legislators, to other people in this room, if you hear from constituents or Vermonters who are having challenges with that program, um, please send them our way. We can do our best to help them. Lastly, before I conclude, and I really wanted to give sort of the, the 40,000 foot federal perspective, um, but I can't help but just mention a couple words about Vermont and the policies that we have undertaken here in partnership with the federal government um, on our all-payer model, our ACO. Um, I think as um, the chair mentioned in beginning today, um, Vermont has really made a focused investment in primary care and mental health care in our state. I think this is a tremendous opportunity for Vermont to get on the front end. And I think one of the big challenges with our healthcare system now is that we are constantly chasing our tails in taking care of people. People wait till they get sick to seek care. They wind up in the emergency department before they get care. And once they get care, the bills are higher, the needs are greater, the specialized medicine that is required is significantly greater if those people had from birth been able to see a primary care provider. So I think that if Vermont is really truly willing to make a generational change here, starting with our youngest Vermonters and ensuring that every single one of them can get into a primary care provider's office, be that a doctor, a nurse practitioner, a physician's assistant, and we care for those children from the beginning, we have a real opportunity to actually change not just the health of our people, but also the healthcare workforce that we need a generation from now. So I would just conclude um, by thanking the panel again for having me here today, and also as a request back to you and back to those here, if you believe that there are federal hindrances to what you wanna do or opportunities within changes to federal law or policy, I would welcome hearing those. I know the Senator would, so that we can help bring the federal government to work for Vermont. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Jessa. Thank you very much. Thank you to the board and the legislators who are here joining us this afternoon. I'm Jessa Barnard, the executive director of the Vermont Medical Society. We are the largest physician membership organization in the state and also um, have PA physician assistant members. We represent physicians of all specialties and practice locations, so not just primary care, though we're pleased to be talking about primary care and focusing on primary care today. I think a lot of the issues that all be focused on apply to all um, physicians and all clinicians, really. So um, I'd like to start, and I, do, I did submit slides um, that I'll generally be following along. Um, I mean, at first, to echo what Liz said, yes, uh, we absolutely support physician um, loan repayment and scholarships funding to get physicians here in the state. We support increased AHEC loan repayment funding <laughs> and also tax incentives for primary care professionals. And I'll also mention support for clinical preceptors. Uh, we know largely that is a voluntary position, but once we get students out in the community to learn what it's like to practice medicine, they learn that they may really love rural medicine or primary care, so whatever we can do to help support busy primary care practices who may be really struggling to fit that in on top of all their clinical responsibilities, um, we think that's really important. Um, but I'm actually, I'm not gonna focus on those issues. They are really outlined in the uh, white paper submitted by the Rural Healthcare Task Force. We support all of the initiatives in that report. Um, but I'm gonna focus a little bit on a different angle, which is how we can make Vermont the best state to practice primary care. And it nicely echoes what Liz has heard from some of the recruits who may be wanting to leave a site where they've been placed, so sometimes what's not going well. Um, because I think we can't, um, as a state, uh, pay our way or buy our way out of the problem of why we are struggling to find primary care physicians. It has to be a better environment to practice as well. 
And I'm going to give a little credit. We had a speaker at um, the, our annual meeting in November from the American Medical Association, Mike Tutty, who's their vice president for professional satisfaction and practice sustainability. Really interesting blend of um, the factors that help physicians uh, stay in medicine or have find joy in the practice of medicine. So I'd encourage anyone to invite him as a speaker. He, it was um, fascinating. So I've um, adapted some of his slides for Vermont. Um, but as we know, nationally, a pretty high percentage of physicians report that they intend to reduce their work hours due to what we call, they call burnout issues. Um, and then we also have Vermont data. This is uh, from the uh, Physician Workforce Survey that the Department of Health does, that a 15% of primary care physicians report they're planning, planning to retire or reduce their hours in Vermont within 12 months. So what can we do if we can't get new physicians as quickly as we want here in Vermont, but we're working on that through a number of other tools, how can we at least support our physicians staying in primary care or maybe putting off retirement another year or two so they can keep caring for the patients who they love to care for for a little bit longer? Um, we know there are a lot of factors impacting a lack of satisfaction in the practice of medicine. And one of the, the quotes that I really liked that um, Mike used was that physician burnout is a symptom of system dysfunction. I think one of the things physicians have been hearing is this has kind of become a buzzword in the practice of medicine, burnout lately, and, I, and it's had a bit of backlash because it implies that it's a lack of skills or resilience in the physician, him or herself. You're just burning out, you're just, you're not tough enough to make it through this. Um, but I think the medical society perspective and the AMA perspective is that it's not the, a problem in the physician, it's the system that we are creating in which that physician is practicing medicine. So the pace of work, EHR requirements, reimbursement levels, prior authorizations, all the administrative and paperwork burden that take a physician away from caring for a patient. And um, I'll mention this uh, organization we're working with a little bit later called Luminos, um, but a quote from, uh, from Luminos that I heard recently is that if you can spend 20% of your time doing what you love, that's about as much as it takes to really keep you happy in your practice. So if we can think about, can we make 20% of a physician's day really um, happy? I, th I think that's achievable. Uh, it's not actually asking that much. Um, and so that may be um, more time with their patients, it may be more time, I'll talk a little bit later about other things that creates uh, real connection and engagement in that profession, uh, that physician's career. Again, I included some statistics, I won't go through all of these, but about the amount of time spent on EHR or desk work each day. Um, one of the slides I found particularly, or data points, kind of um, compelling is there's a, there's a chart of uh, the amount, the, the, they did a time study of when physicians are logging into their EHRs to document their clinical, you know, catch up with patient records. And then you'll see there's this big kind of peak midday and then kind of a tail off at the end of the, the day on work night, on work, during the work week. But then you'll see on Saturday night, another spike. So physicians are logging back in, doing work, and what they call date night time. When, when the rest of us may be reading a book, getting some exercise, watching a movie, they are having to log back in and um, catch up on paperwork. And that's not, we you know, a sustainable way of practice. Um, so what can we do to improve the practice environment? And on another of the slides I, I stole um, from the AMA borrowed, um, lays out that there are individual interventions, organizational interventions, and health system interventions. So we need to work on these issues at all levels. It's not just one locus of change. And I've included, um, the board asked for sort of us to talk organizationally about what we're doing. So some of this is about what BMS is doing, but it's also about how we're trying to encourage physician practices, hospitals, medical staffs around the state to look at these issues. So, for the individual, we think about it, how can we help physicians find their passion and their peer group? So again, this passion being the 20, can we find something that in 20% of their time, they just love what they're doing? And of course, that's taking care of patients, but it may also be other ways of engaging, feeling like they have some voice in this health system, some way of making change, some way of improving their environment. So we've worked with, um, we've partnered with uh, the Daniel Hanley Center for Health Leadership, a Maine-based um, physician training organization to launch this year, we've just started, as we call it our Physician Executive Leadership Institute. So we have a course, um, we have 19, uh, 19 phys uh, 18 physicians, one PA, going through our first year of training in everything from systems change, quality improvement, communication skills, what are the non uh, sort of patient touch skills that they didn't get in medical school but that might help them lead change within their organization or the state. 
Um, so we think that a lot for a lot of physicians we work with, being able to have the bigger picture of how can I improve my practice, how can I improve my hospital, how can I engage with the legislature, the Green Mountain Care Board, feel like I'm having an impact on my practice environment. So we're offering training in that regard. We are um, have been working with this organization I mentioned, Luminos. They've done a lot of work out of state, actually in Colorado. Um, but they are now partnering with us here in Vermont to present at medical staffs around the state on tools for individual clinician well-being. How do you find that 20% of your life that gives you the most, um, the most satisfaction? So if you are a clinician and you work at a hospital and would like a or large practice and would like us to come and offer that presentation, we're doing that. We also think it's really important. There's been a, a general. Um, I think lessening of relationships between clinicians over time as it's become a movement towards hospitalist services and community-based physicians. There's not as much opportunity for interaction and just pure collegiality, peer support, peer relationships. Um, so we're gonna be offering, again, through Luminos, some regional gatherings just to learn about ways and models of connecting with your, your peers over the fall. Um, and then we're also offering um, sort of an alumni group of this leadership course to keep those connections. This is the leadership course that we're offering it has physicians from all over the state. Um, almost every location, almost every hospital has sort of contributed a, a participant to that course. So we think these relationships across the state are really important and we'll be wanting to continue that through an alumni group. So that's sort of on the more individual in physician level, but what can organizations do, so hospitals and practices, FQHCs? Um, again, we're having these, uh, these presentations we're offering with Luminos, and those, those are intended to give not just individual skills, but what can organizations do to improve their practice environment? And I've included some slides that kind of reflect some of that information that they're showing. So what are steps to prevent burnout in your practice? Doing things like surveys of the staff, you know, what's working well, what isn't, starting wellness committees, um, meaning to then look at, well, what's causing dissatisfaction and what as a practice can we do to address those issues? And then sharing um, practice redesign tools, um, and this is just as a sample, the American Medical Association has a Steps Forward um, program that offers a lot of modules. How can we do things like um, just looking at our workflow in our practice to minimize as much as possible administrative burden, paperwork burden, um, things like improving team documentation, things as simple as looking at your, your steps through the office during the day. You know, they give this example of, you know, there's one printer down the hall, so every time you're printing something, you know, a, a lab summary, you're having to walk down the hall to go pick that piece of paper up. Well, for 50 bucks these days, or $100, you can get another printer in the exam room, and that can actually save quite a bit of time. So every time you walk down the hall, it's not just walking down the hall, you're getting interrupted by the nurse and the MA and the, this person and that person. So how can we streamline um, the day for primary care clinicians. And then where um, VMS actually focuses a lot of our work is sort of the healthcare system. How can we make the system work better for physicians? And I gave some examples of um, not some items that are actually in the, um, the Rural Healthcare Task Force report and things that VMS have been working on for years and we hope to continue to move the needle. They're tough issues, but just absolutely critical to wanting to practice primary care in Vermont. Um, so again, building a system that pays for and recognizes primary care, we think the ACO is certainly a step in the right direction in that regard and continuing that work. Streamlining quality measures, how can we do more reporting through claims versus manual data submission, aligning quality measures, reducing prior authorization. The ACO, um, as many of you in the room know, has a prior authorization pilot. Can we expand that? Can we grow that? Um, and can we hold payers responsible for expanding their gold card programs, which are, you know, if you get a certain number of your prior authorizations approved each year, can you sort of get a pass and having to continue to do that? We've had some positive conversations. We'd love to see that um, come to fruition. And then we, as an organization, partner with the AMA on a number of federal initiatives um, that may be beyond the scope of what we can address here in Vermont. They're also causing big burdens on positions, so EHR issues, um, MACRA, MIPS, kind of pay for quality programs which are very um, expensive to comply with and, and difficult to comply with, um, and other sort of federal uh, paperwork reduction initiatives. So again, thank you. It's a little bit of a different perspective, but again, I think just improving the practice environment is critical to keeping our workforce here in the state. Thank you, Jessica. Helen? All right. So I'm I'm Helen Laban. I'm the Public Policy Director for Vermont for Bi-State Primary Care Association. We represent a range of primary care 
uh, organizations, many of whom are federally qualified health centers, and a lot of what I say today is based on the FQHC work. And more specifically, the work of my colleague, Stephanie Paliupa, who runs the Workforce Recruitment Center for Bi-State. She is sorry, she was una unable to be here today. Um, I am filling in for her and will be carefully following my notes from her. <laughs> um, I, you know, I would just say for my own background, my background is in rural economic development. I have a lot to say about dairy pricing systems. Like that's my like core working landscape type background. Um, I do find it interesting, you know, healthcare providers are the major employers of our rural landscape when you actually look at the numbers. So, you know, myself and Bice would have a lot to say about integrating this into the broader rural economic development conversation, looking at the range of skill levels and skill sets involved, the Grow Your Own Talent pipeline that can go into these healthcare providers. Uh, that being said, I'm speaking for the recruitment center, so I'll be talking about recruitment, not all that other stuff. But it's not for lack of also caring about that. Um, so the uh, Vice State Recruitment Center has been in New Hampshire since 1994 and in Vermont since 2003. We work with primary care practices in medically underserved areas, not only the FQHCs, we also work with eight small hospitals and a handful of independent practices as well. And we are working to recruit primary care uh, providers in a, in a range of different positions uh, into our two states. So we currently have 71 vacancies that we're helping recruit for. Uh, and the largest group is family physicians, but also pediatrics, physician assistants, psychiatrists, um, other mental health at a bachelor or master's degree, and dentists. And the mix changes you know, from month to month. And we feel pretty urgent about this. Everyone has said they weren't going to focus on the problem, and, and neither will I, but there are fewer primary care folks entering primary care and more folks interested in retiring, so we all know how that math works out. Um, we focus less on convincing people to go into primary care and more on convincing them to come to Vermont and to rural Vermont uh, in particular. So what that looks like is we would go to conferences with students who are already interested in primary care, or perhaps folks who have completed their training and they're trying to decide where to locate, and we would work with them on finding a good match for our communities and for our practices in Vermont. Um, we work with the organizations who are doing the hiring into integrating retention plans from the very beginning. And a retention plan is not just your salary negotiation, right? We're looking at the strong fit for the community, and often that's a lifestyle question. If you don't like the outdoors or crappy weather, maybe <laughs> there are areas of Vermont you're not going to be happy in, right? Um, and it's also job structure questions, like whether people are working at the top of their license, um, how to balance time with patients and time with paperwork, something you will hear a lot about probably from every single person. Uh, opportunities for education and skill development, and the question of, do you feel supported in that skill development? Uh, one thing that we are looking at more, for example, is whether telehealth connections can help you feel supported, which we have evidence it does. So it doesn't necessarily mean just in that practice, but a modernization of practices to take advantage of all the resources available to them to help those folks feel supported. The actually, just said, uh, many of the things that Stephanie would have said about practice transformation, and I'll just skip over all of those and save you time. Uh, but I will say that the immediate culture of the organization where someone is working is obviously really important, but so is the culture of doing healthcare in Vermont. So are we doing progressive things around healthcare, around healthcare access, things like an all pair model and ACO, for example. Um, and does that then work its way into providers feel like they're part of that innovation, they're part of being on the front lines of doing this reform work? And for FQHCs, that's particularly important because when you have that designation, you there's just a crushing magnitude of federal bureaucracy that then comes down upon you when you have that designation, which is great because Everyone's making sure that they're providing access to care the way they should be, but we really need an avenue towards flexibility and innovation so that people feel invested in the future and in the future of healthcare. And our broad reform programs like the ACO as a way to help people have that investment and feel like they're part of something bigger and making a real difference. Uh, I should say that by state now, I'm going to read Stephanie's numbers. By state has been successful in making these connections. 
In a 20-year retention study of by state recruit providers, 66% were still working in the region where they were originally arrived, 26% of them in the exact same location, often many of them for more than 15 years, which I personally find hard to imagine in the same place for 15 years, um, and, and many of them planning to work there their entire career. And we're having this success in the retention partially by giving ourselves a particular problem statement. Right? We're not trying to solve all of the healthcare workforce shortage in primary care. We're recruiting people who are already interested in primary care to communities where we think they are a good match. And then we're helping those provider organizations bring on these new employees in a way that leads to strong retention rates. So we really define for ourselves what it is that we are solving. And we can get pretty creative within that lane. So for example, in New Hampshire, we are helping expand a fellowship program for psychiatric uh, nurse practitioners that for their first year of employment has a mentorship system and continuing education and, and a fellowship for them. Uh, we also have worked in New Hampshire around um, supporting uh, local organizations and how they recruit for substance use disorder treatments to try and get away from the, I'm gonna steal from the next town over phenomenon that happens when you have a workforce shortage. So we do get fairly creative. I should say many of the examples are from New Hampshire because New Hampshire pays us um, <laughs> to do that. We get grants from the state of New Hampshire, so many of them are on the other side of the state, um, other side of the river. Uh, being able to have this focus in this specialty and, and set our own problem statement really relies on a broad network of other supports being in place. So although we may not be working ourselves with loan repayments, or scholarships, we certainly support those. Also the idea of, and getting back to the opening statement around the larger world of rural economic development, how is Vermont marketing itself as a place to come and work? You know, to Liz's point about calling it a crisis and having one wants to work in primary care, that may not be helpful from a marketing perspective. <laughs> um, and are we building a positive story about the progressive and wonderful things we're doing with access to care? in Vermont and how people want to be a part of that. Uh, so with that, we'd appreciate participating in conversations like this one, uh, like the Primary Care Advisory Group, like the Rural Health Services Task Force, and we think that those ongoing conversations are really important to moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Joe? I don't have any slides. Um, I would say, um, I would refer everybody here to Dr. Holman's piece in the former. She's much more eloquent than I and uh, stated the issues quite well, I thought. I think it made it to the Mountain Herald, too. I can dig her. <laughs> it didn't make it to the Mountain Village or Jericho. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do think it was excellent. Um, I would start by one thing, having done this, I've been at the Thomas Ditton Health Center in Williston since 1978, so this is my 42nd year. And I think you have to stress, and those not in it may not understand, that the patients we take care of as outpatients now are far, far sicker than they were not only 40 years ago, even 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, Monday, I it's a busy day because the patient's coming out of the hospital. We now have transition visits. We must do it at a certain time. Um, and they're all five patients. But out of those 22 patients, six of them would have been dead 10 years ago. And I think it's important to realize how much sicker and how much more difficult outpatient primary care now is than it was even 10 or 15 years ago. Hospitalists have helped in many ways um, they certainly prolong your career. I was one of the ones that resented having to have hospitals, but it, it does make sense, and in retrospect, it was the right thing to do. But the patients coming out of the hospital are so much sicker, the patients we keep alive and stay out of the hospital are so much sicker, that the job is harder than it used to be. <coughs> I do reflect more, I've been on a lot of these committees, but I reflect the in the trenches point of view and not the 40,000 foot point of view, and I agree it'd be nice to have more people in the trenches trying to help the 40,000 foot, but if you're in the trenches, you don't have any interest or time to do that stuff, uh, it's really hard. But I think that would be helpful. I would point out, as Dr. Holman's article mentions, 
um, the three big problems. First of all, you have to face it, it's reimbursement. And uh, I was in a big committee with Kevin Kelly, who used to be the director of the FJC in Morrison, I think. And the big problem of getting people going to primary care just to remove the burden of reimbursement is we now compete with hospital ERs and hospitals. And um, we have more hours, more responsibilities, and many more forms to fill out at 20 or 30 or 40 percent less reimbursement. And we don't want to just focus on money as it was mentioned earlier, but that's a very real thing. The second thing I would mention is um, the non-reimbursed bureaucratic administrative overhead imposed by all the programs are a big issue for people not going into or leaving primary care. And for whatever programs come about in the future, uh, they shouldn't be tied with more of that. I would say we've had innumerable programs. Our practice is, I don't know if it's a large or small practice, but one of the larger group practices, independent group practices in the state. And we feel we're large enough to take advantage of a lot of these programs, but small enough to be nimble to react to them. But virtually all the programs that have been proposed or implemented in my 40 years have added to reimbursement in a primary care office a little bit and added to the bureaucratic or administrative overhead a lot. And we have to make sure whatever comes down the road doesn't do that because it's one of the things that's wearing people out. And the third thing, um, this may be with the denominator as those going into primary care and not the denominator as all students. But loan repayment is a big deal. In our practice, as an independent primary care, we don't qualify for the uh, PSF, PSLFP, or the, and even in Chittenden County, um, the loan repayment plan, where, uh, as opposed to the rural parts of the state, is a difficult thing to overcome for those, those going into primary care. I would agree, uh, I, would, I don't want to be Bernie to somebody else as Senator Warren, but I think we are at, a, at least asymptotically approaching a crisis. Um, it's really difficult to recruit primary care physicians, especially PAs and nurse practitioners to a lesser extent, and even in Chittenden County, where supposedly people want to live. Um, it is a challenge for the long haul, I agree. Dr. Brumstead has said for five or 10 years in meetings that, well, in five or 10 years, the primary care will be in the driver's seat. But we have to get to that five or 10 years without everybody being gone. And uh, I think we have to look at it sooner than that. I would say, I was born and raised on a farm, so I can't leave this out. I don't get my time up here very often, so I'm <laughs> I would say trying to figure out the milk price is a lot, in a lot of ways, analogous to try, trying to figure out what you're going to get paid for by Medicare, because it's nebulous and impossible. We have, and if, I don't know if we'll ever get the single payer, but uh, our office has 80 different insurance companies or entities that we bill through. And um, that increases a lot of overhead and makes it a lot more difficult. I do think um, I don't know if the ACO, and I'm not sure I'm supposed to talk about this up here now. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I'd open that up for questions again. I'm on the AC board, and uh, I'm in the trenches, um, and our practice does participate in a um, capitation-like pilot with the ACO, which has been beneficial to our office um, without too much induced overhead or induced data reporting, mainly because we were reporting all that data before for everybody. Um, and that's been beneficial for our practice. Now, we're one of only four or five practices doing it, and I would say that the reason we entered this was that, it was my opinion three or four years ago, that the worst thing that can happen in primary care is if you don't try something new. And um, notwithstanding all the digger articles and what you all have to figure out from the Green Run Care Board, in the trenches, from my point of view, 
or our practice's point of view, that small portion of the ACO, it's called the CPR, how do you like that? <laughs> of all things, we're on CPR. Uh, has a comprehensive case pain at your form or cardiopulmonary resuscitation. I don't know. <laughs> but it has been beneficial. I don't know if it'll stay. Um, I worry that worry maybe I'm wrong, but I have a concern that CMS they give you a five year trial. If you try anything like this in medicine, five years isn't gonna tell you anything. And you're gonna have to do it longer to see if it really does work. And I think there's value just as there is any drug trials, it's a value to find, try a drug and find out it doesn't work well, and you at least know that. So if you try a payment reform and it doesn't work well, you go on to try something else. Um, if you have questions about that, I'm happy to answer that. Um, I do think we're at a crossroads in primary care. And uh, I think it can't be a, a solution that takes 10 years because my age and people my age aren't going to be here in five years. So, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for those words of encouragement. <laughs> I didn't offer any plans, did I? <laughs> Krista. <laughs> oh. oh my gosh. <laughs> Good afternoon, and thank you to the board for the opportunity to represent the Larner College of Medicine as well as the University of Vermont Medical Center and Network in today's conversation. And thank you to all of those in attendance as well as our panelists, many, if not all of them, who are um, very involved in our medical education program and or collaborate um, with us on many initiatives. A little bit of background, I um, have served in the interim role as Senior Associate Dean for Medical Education for the past year. However, I've been involved in medical education for about 20 years. I'm also a Vermonter who grew up in a very rural community, North Hero, Vermont, um, and then chose to attend medical school in Vermont, selected a primary care specialty in pediatrics, and then chose to return to Vermont to practice. Um, I also did participate in a loan repayment program, and that was um, incredibly helpful to me. I think that we're pretty fortunate to have a medical school in the state of Vermont. We're a pretty small rural state. We were established in 1822, and we are currently the seventh oldest medical school in the country, which currently has 152 medical schools. And I do think that we attract a lot of Vermonters, as well as those interested in the outdoors. Um, as well as many who are interested in primary care. We're a public medical school, however, we have limited um, state appropriations and we certainly have increased our enrollment in recent years to try and address not only the Vermont shortage but the national shortage in physicians. Um, most recently, I'm new to my position, we also have a new dean, Dean Rick Page, who joined us in October of 2018, and we were sitting at um, enrollment of 120 medical students per year, and we made a decision um, to increase. We had close conversations with our fire marshal, because we are limited in space capacity, but however, we were able to increase an additional four, um, and so now we enroll 124 medical students. Without any additional state appropriations, Dean Page and I made the decision to increase the, out of those four new enrollments to have two of those be Vermonters. So um, we have 124 students enrolled and we have 30 um, that are Vermonters. I would like people to know that previously we enrolled 36 Vermonters. Um, however, the state wanted to kind of take a new direction, and so we have to reduce down to 28 Vermonters. Again, keep in mind we just went back up by 2 to 30. Um, and the state chose to invest in a longitudinal integrated clerkship, which we are currently running, both at a federally qualified health center in Hudson Headwaters Health Network, um, as well as this year adding one um, at Central Vermont Medical Center. And that type of clinical training um, really can introduce students to um, primary care. You're paired with a primary care physician and really follow your panel of student, uh, panel of patients, sorry, 
to different medical experiences that they may encounter. However, that's a pretty resource um, heavy way to train. One of our recent applicants said, how come everyone isn't trained in a longitudinal integrated clerkship? And you're pairing a student with one provider, so it's pretty resource heavy. So it's um, a great opportunity, but you have limited number of students that you can put through that type of curriculum. Um, you know, as a medical school, we have lots of data, both on students matriculating and on students graduating, and we consistently see that about a third of our um, matriculating students and, uh, and then um, uh, still at graduation are interested in practicing primary care. I'll make sure to clarify that when we say primary care, we do include family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics, and in most cases, obstetrics and gynecology is included in that. Um, and you know, we've been pretty consistent in the percentage of graduates who enter a primary care residency. So over the last four years, we've been at 41% of our graduates entering primary care. Now it's important, I think, to sometimes pull family medicine out of that, and so um, because again, you're including other specialties. So we're pretty consistent at 10 to 15 percent of our graduates entering um, family medicine residencies. And I'll add that we can look at data from matriculating students interested in family medicine and then those who end up um, graduating and entering a residency program in family medicine. And in our curriculum, our students' interest in family medicine actually increases as they're going through the curriculum. And that's a testament to our um, providers that are working with our students in those clinical experiences. Um, I do appreciate that certainly I think competitiveness of the specialty and income expectations and level of education that do influence medical student graduates and the decisions they make. And you heard Liz Cody talk about national data. We also have um, Learner College of Medicine specific data and we're pretty encouraged that our students um, actually find other factors that influence them more than, than those things and actually um, their level of education debt um, decreases as uh, having that influence their decision decreases as they move through the curriculum and is pretty low less than 20 percent um, you know certainly debt is a national issue education debt is a problem and medical school education debt is a significant problem but the Learner College of Medicine fully supports President Garamella from the university's decision to freeze tuition. Um, so we're participating in that as well. And, um, you know, my area of expertise is more around education for medical students, but we closely collaborate with our colleagues um, in the graduate medical education program. And so some additional information from there is that um, we do know that 33% of Vermont physicians currently and 41% of the primary care physicians in Vermont either educated or trained at the Learner College of Medicine or the UVM Medical Center. So the Medical Center has 17 residency programs that includes one dental um, program and many of those dental residents actually stay in, to practice in Vermont and 25 fellowship programs. So there's currently 275 residents um, and fellows, and 80% are residents and 20% fellows. And 49% of the resident graduates are in primary care, again, how we define that, including um, obstetrics. However, the medical center is um, exceed, well exceeds its federal cap for um, residency training positions, and so that's a challenge um, to, to consider increasing the number of residency programs. Um, so, you know, I think we need to look at a couple of different areas. Certainly the Learner College of Medicine um, would be happy to consider increasing the number of Vermonters. Um, however, we need additional state appropriation support and other areas of support for that. Additional scholarship funding I think would be incredibly important. Um, increased ability to train um, medical students in those primary care areas or longitudinal integrated clerkships. 
and um, increase graduate medical education opportunities. So we remain committed to working with our colleagues and partners to identifying um, creative solutions. And I just encourage people to keep in mind, um, I think Helen referred to this too, working with individuals who have already made a decision or a commitment to primary care is, I think, important to consider. I have worked with medical students for many years and trying to recruit them before they've had any exposure to the different clinical opportunities does run the risk of sort of boxing someone into a career. When I work with my students, I say it's really, really important that you're passionate about what you pursue because that will allow you to be the most successful. So I don't want us to create any programs or, or um, solutions that might um, encourage people to do primary care before they've really had a chance to appreciate and um, become passionate about that. So thank you. Thank you. Kathleen. Um, thank you for the opportunity. I'm Kathleen Morrow. I'm the Chair of Community and Family Medicine at Across the River at Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. And um, I'm going to try hard to say only new things and nothing that repeating a lot of what's already been said. So forgive me if I'm jumping around a little bit. But I want to start with telling you my personal story because it's relevant. Um, I uh, grew up, I was born and raised in uh, Washington, D.C. in New York City. I was not a rural kid, nor would I have ever been someone identified as someone who was going to spend her entire medical career as a family physician in northern New England, which is who I am. And, and so I just want to underscore that rurality and origins of, of rural uh, birth are key component to making physicians for rural areas, but not the only one. And at Dartmouth-Hitchcock and at Geisel School of Medicine, a lot of our focus is in identifying early in training physicians with a passion for making a difference, for caring about change in the healthcare system, and then the care and perpetual feeding of them. And I can assure you that that is a very full-time, ongoing, work that requires commitment from a lot of people and faculty. Because the tertiary care uh, training environment is not conducive to producing primary care physicians who will work in rural and underserved areas. I um, did my training at UVM and I credit UVM enormously with my 30 years of work in only rural uh, practice in Northern New England. I spent about 18 years of that in Maine, and the last 10 years of it have been um, in, at, at Dartmouth. Um, and UVM had a culture and an environment that was positive and supportive about family medicine. I can't say that as, as strongly about Geisel School of Medicine or Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center, and I can say with some clarity that both environments um, are tertiary care academic medical centers, and they are largely structured, funded, and designed to train specialists. So you're going to hear my emphasis is on how we care and feed medical students who come in idealistic and, and, and interested and committed to the kind of work that we're all talking about today that we need more folks doing, and then also, very importantly, the um, under-residency um, development in both our, of our two states. So let me just start with, I was asked to talk about what guys in the Dartmouth do. We have all kinds of enrichment programs at the Geisel School of Medicine for early identification of medical students. UVM has very similar ones. Um, uh, family Medicine Interest Group, Rural Health Scholars, Migrant Health Scholars, uh, Med Student for a Day. We have all kinds of programs that are designed to help us identify who's interested in the beginning. And then we try very hard to maintain those medical students' interests throughout their exposure to the clinical work that they will be doing largely inside academic medical centers. So my, um, I can't say it strongly enough, the placement of students in rural communities, 
with one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one -on -one relationships with worldly-based family physicians is really, really critical to development. The physician sitting next to me probably has had more influence on turning Geisel medical students into family doctors than just about anybody else in our, on our faculty. The power of an individual relationship early in the training cannot, I cannot underscore it enough. And then the second big issue, that's a real issue, so Maine has four family medicine residencies. We're talking about three states that have roughly the same populations, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, smaller. But proportionally speaking, the number of family medicine residencies, and I'm speaking very firmly about family med residencies, because despite UVM and Geisel both liking to talk about how many physicians they produce in primary care, the cold, hard reality is if you want to have physicians who will work in rural and underserved communities, you really have to train family physicians. Internal medicine has many primary care tracks, but the vast majority of people who go into internal medicine residencies, 85 or better percent, go into subspecialty medicine. So they become cardiologists and nephrologists and rheumatologists. So if you're focusing your limited resources, which I would argue all of us are, in training physicians who really will work in rural and underserved communities, then you really have to to focus your resources on family medicine. And that's something I spend a lot of my days at Geisel and at Dartmouth-Hitchcock helping the administrations and executives of those institutions understand and help focus on resource allocation to develop further residency training programs. So Vermont currently only has one. Uh, family medicine training program. Well, actually, it's not true because there's so one, one, and half. Half. one and a half. Right. So one, in, which is great because that's another underserved uh, region. And um, New Hampshire only has one in in Concord, the Concord Family Medicine Residency Program. Maine has four. So proportionally, there are four times the number of residents coming out of being produced in family medicine in Maine as there are in Vermont and New Hampshire. And so a great deal of my work at the moment is developing a new family medicine residency program in Cheshire Medical Center, which is in New Hampshire, part of the Dartmouth-Hitchcock system. And um, we are also working alongside your partners at Southwestern Vermont and helping them with the development, very early development. Um, both of these residencies are probably a couple of years at at least off in the future, but helping them with their development of a residency training program. Um, this is a really critical component of, of developing physicians who will train in your state and therefore stay in your state. The national data is pretty strong that somewhere between 55 and 65 percent of residents stay where they train in their residency program. And there are many exceptions, and I'm going to just close with telling you one story about that. So at Geisel, we produce, we're small, we have 90 students a year. As you know, we're an Ivy League school with a very large competitive uh, pool of students from all over the country and all over the world. There is no emphasis on primary care training or primary care interest in terms of admission. And yet for the last five years, the chair of admissions has been a family doc. And obviously, he's had a lot of influence. I can't say that he's been able to turn admissions around at Dartmouth overnight, but he's had some influence. We see a lot of those 90 kids come in with genuine interest in, in primary care. And then the course, the nature of the culture of the training, the way the training uh, proceeds tends to reduce that interest incrementally. And with all due respect to the people who told you data about money um, not mattering, <laughs> money matters, and money matters a lot, and it matters more and more and more. 
So I'm going to end by telling you about Rachel and Chris LaRocca. Chris LaRocca was our chair of the mission for the last five years, a family doc who's just ending 30 years of practice in Walpole, New Hampshire. His daughter went to Geisel School of Medicine, left the state to go to um, her residency training out west. And I will tell you that the majority of our residents, uh, excuse me, our, our fourth year medical students who go into family medicine, go out west for their training. And I've gotten over that. And it's because there tends to be more positive environments for residency training out west. Family medicine is seen as the primary care specialty out west in a more robust way. So many of our students go, but then the wonderful thing about Northern New England is people want to come back. And I, I hand, we all have, have handhold those students through their residencies and then recruit them back. And we've been quite successful in doing that. Rachel just returned. She looked very hard all over Vermont and New Hampshire at, at um, many multiple sites that wanted to recruit her. She ended up at Ottaquichi Health Center, which is part of the Scutney Health Center. And when I said to her, in the end, what was important, she listed a number of those factors you hear, but in the end, she said the best loan and payment was at Ottaquichi, period. And if you're a kid from a working family, her dad was a family doc, but remember family docs are paid at about a minimum of half to a third of what all the other specialties are paid. And her mom's a school teacher, so she was fully indebted through her training at Geisel School of Medicine. You know the data, the average medical student, the average medical student comes out with $196,000 of debt. If you're a private school, student, you come out with substantially more than that. If you're a state school student, you might come out with a little bit less than that. But that debt's real. And if you look at a starting salary coming out of residency training of 180000 to 200000 which is what family docs get offered, as compared to 450000 to 500000 which is what a great deal of the other specialties get offered, I mean, do the math. It's a big deal. And, and students, idealistic, want to make a difference, really committed to their work, have to take that into consideration, particularly as the economies of the healthcare system get more and more complex and the uncertainties. So please don't underscore the importance of money in this whole conversation. Thanks. Thank you, Kathleen. Okay. Geez, I hardly know where to start because we've covered so many things, but um, we, we spoke this morning, several of us in front of the legislature, and what we were trying to do was focus on solutions. Um, there are just a couple of statistics that I think are worth saying about the problem before I talk about solutions. Um, right now in Vermont, there's a need for 70 primary care providers. That is uh, really an unachievable number from a recruiting standpoint. We have one um, of the offices in our federally qualified health center has been recruiting for six years for a primary care position. So 70 is a huge number, but just to reinforce how much worse that number is going to get over the next few years, 36% of the primary care workforce is over the age of 60. Um, so if you look at the next five to 10 years, um, this does get, really does get critical. So trying to focus on strategies on real things that we can do that would make a difference. I think the selection of students for medical school is critical. There's all kinds of data on how to zero in on students who are likely to stay in primary care. Some of that has to do with their backgrounds, being less advantaged, um, sometimes rural back background, but some of it also has to do with non-traditional students, people who have worked in a non-medical field before entering med school. There's no reason we can't hand select students for our medical school to meet the needs of our state. I hear the testimony on the scholarship um, repayment not being 
critical and tuition, uh, you know, so um, loan repayment and tuition waivers not being critical. It doesn't square with what I hear in my practice. We teach students from both Dartmouth and UVM over and over again. I hear students who say, I love this experience. This is what I want to do, but I can't do it. And I have met several students who have $400,000 in debt when, when you get your undergraduate and your medical school together, 400000 So it's really not a valid choice to, to go into primary care if you're carrying that kind of debt. <clears throat> the training issue, the residency issue, is a huge one. Just to reiterate, um, I think Kathy and I have had an inclination to talk about family physicians because 92% of family doctors who are trained to stay in primary care. Of course, pediatrics and internal medicine are primary care specialties, but you lose about 50% of those to specializing in pediatrics, and as Kathy said, about 85% of internists specialize. So um, we do need to train more residents in our state. Vermont has the fewest number. I, I, we're going to quibble about this number, I can tell already, but Vermont has six residency slots per year in family medicine. There are some across the um, lake in New York that are part of the UVM network. Um, but in Vermont, six slots per year in family medicine. That's 18 total because it's a three-year residency. We have somewhere around 300 residents in the state. Um, we're not doing enough. UVM Medical Center has the power to shift some of those residency positions from specialty care into primary care. It will change business as usual. It, will be, it won't be easy to implement, but it really needs to happen. Residents, who, people who graduate from residency tend to stay where they are trained, and we can do better on that. We can start new ones, as Kathy was talking about, and we can also shift the ones at the medical center. Continuing support of loan repayment, I think, is critical. Early exposure to family medicine, I think, is, is critical. By and large, for the, when we teach University of Vermont students, that's, that's mostly a voluntary position that we can have the community do. Dartmouth has been paying for the last maybe 10 years or so, um, paying a stipend for teaching. Um, and there is a, um, a small stipend for medical education credits, for education credits from University of Vermont. But, Valuing the primary care physicians who are teaching in their offices in some way, I think, is very important. We talked about decreasing administrative burden. I know everyone's heard a lot about that in primary care, but I think that is also critical. Tax credits to help people who are trained elsewhere to move into the state, I think, are worth thinking about. There are a number of states who have let that sort of legislation. Um, to help offset your loan, the cost of your loans if you choose to move to Vermont. I understand there's been a, a program in Vermont to pay people to move to the state. Um, let's dust that off and make it specific for a workforce that we desperately need here. Um, and then finally, I guess I'd like to expand a little on, on the whole concept of culture change around family med around primary care. This is nebulous, it's not as actionable as some of the things I just listed. But nobody ever told me when I was in training that family medicine was a fantastic career. I knew it appealed to me because there was a lot going on and you could use, you, you, I knew it was going to be intellectually stimulating, but nobody told me that I was going to love it more and more as time went on because the longer I knew patients, the more I connected with them and the more important that my, my role with them um, was. We often got the message that Family medicine and primary care was um, where people who can't get into specialty residencies go. I taught a medical student recently who was told by her advisor, why would you want to go into family medicine when you can specialize, then you know everything you need to know about your, about your field. If you go into family medicine, you're, you're going to not know, you're accepting not knowing everything about your field. So the messaging and the culture, I think, I teach students from both medical schools and, and I think um, it, it there is a different way to talk about primary care that lets people know that this is a phenomenally powerful and rewarding and um, keeps you interested for your whole career, that I didn't really appreciate that when I got started. Um, so finally, I guess I'll just close by saying that, you know, healthcare reform is complicated and there's a lot that's not in our control in Vermont. Um, I don't think we're going to, in Vermont, dismantle the medical industrial complex, although it would be fun. 
<laughs> but some of the things that we've talked that we've talked about today really are actionable items, and if we're really looking for decrease in cost in healthcare, there's no particular way to do that without a robust primary care workforce. If we want to ensure universal access to primary care, there's no road forward for that without a robust primary care workforce. And healthcare reform in general, I think, is, is not possible without really uh, addressing this problem from as many angles as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Okay, I'm trying to figure out how to follow everybody. <laughs> Everything has been said, essentially, and I think that, you know, this morning I started out talking with uh, the committee about sort of some of the things that, that rural primary care doctors do that other people might not know they do. So when I think about primary care, and one of the reasons that it just adds to what Faye just said is that, you know, my patients who live in a small town in Eden or Lowell or Herbig really don't have the time, money, or gas to get to Burlington to go to a specialist. They really want, if we, if possible, for us to take care of everything there. If possible, they'd like us to take care of it on the phone because <laughs> that's even cheaper. But money does matter to our patients. We have to go back to kind of why are we doing this? We're doing this because our patients need a doctor, they need the doctor to be close, and they need the doctor to be competent and comprehensive. So, you know, for anyone in the room that wasn't there this morning, you know, I don't think people know that the only doctors, and I, again, we're kind of biased with them, and I'm sure they'll go on this end of the table, but you know, everything from full spectrum gynecologic care, contraceptive management, IUD placement, joint injections, shoulders, knees, SI joints, we do all kinds of pediatric, but obviously full spectrum pediatric care, I round on the newborns at our nursery where I'm supposed to be right now. <laughs> have to copy because we don't have a pediatrician on staff. So there's a couple family doctors and we all take a week at a time and we are the pediatricians for the hospital. We take care of all the patients at the manor, the nursing home. We do house calls still. And if patients come in on a Saturday with the flu or chest pain or symptoms of appendicitis or meningitis, we get them where they go right away. So it's really full spectrum care and it's exciting. And so it continues to puzzle me, you know, when we go back to all these things and we say, why is this lowest paid field? Why is it that my specialist partners across the road are making five times what I make? And that, yes, I would agree that that does matter to potential med students, especially those in debt. I also agree that the experience that medical students have with us in the office does shape them and does hopefully guide them. And if nothing else, when they go into a specialty, they understand what we can do and who to talk to and how to, re how to refer back to us. Oftentimes, I'd like, I really like the specialists that I can refer to and have the patients come back, especially endocrinologists. It's really nice. I want to take care of our people. So if I was to think of some things that are just kind of outside the box that just you know, worth, might be worth talking about, one of the things that um, Ken, who's a medical student I'm working with, who's sitting right next to his president, which is kind of cool. Um, and I've talked about it, it's like board scores, for example. Why are board scores not pass-fail? There's this hidden curriculum that really influences the culture. If you have a high board score, you get to go into one specialty. If you have a low board score, you kind of are left with family medicine. That should be pass-fail. That does influence culture. I don't know if that's a hot topic, but there we go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think you got us excited over here. So there you go. Start the conversation. Um, you know, the scholarship idea, I don't want to box anybody in. I don't want them doing family medicine if they don't want to do it. But if somebody wants to do it and they decide that in their second or third year, let's figure out a way to help them pay for it so that we can get them on the ground. And that's just, we, we can design a different system, but something along the lines of scholarship would help because we're asking people to pay a, a lot of money and 45, 55% of whom are female when they graduate, they're probably going to have a family that decreases their FTE. It's still the same number of loans as everyone else, but they're paying it off slower to make less money. Still carrying a full panel of patients. So figuring out how to both narrow the pay gap and provide some, some financial help to get to the point where we have people on the ground. 
I think some of the other things that just would, I like the idea of another residency in Vermont, and CDH came to mind, you know, pretty good sized hospital, it's part of the UPN network. And the other two, kind of may also stir the pot a little bit, which would be, what about transparency of rates? If I do a skin biopsy in my office, and Derm does one in their office, that's a different cost. I think if it was transparent across the board, and somehow we'd have to correct for the fact that all the insurance is going to be different amount for everything, patients might understand that going to their primary care costs less, and we'd start to use capitalism to our advantage. And then finally, primary care for all. <laughs> you know, if patients, if going to your primary care doc was free, again, incentivizing wellness exams, but also the sprained ankle, the sprained wrist doesn't need to go to the ER orthopedics. It could really come to the primary where it is less expensive and we do just as good a job. So, you know, I think that there are a lot of, lot of moving parts and a lot of solutions. We have to think about both long and short term ones. Um, I'll do better not to use the word crisis. But um, again, we've got so many great people here. I'll just close with one thing. There was a Dartmouth study a couple years ago that studied medical school, medical students' perceptions about primary care. But there haven't been a lot of actual studies. There's a lot of data, but there's not necessarily a lot of studies along these lines. And that could be done. That really needs to be done. So let's use evidence-based medicine to fix medicine. Thank you. But before we start to toss out a couple of questions, uh, at the uh, beginning of uh, this afternoon, we recognized uh, uh, Chairman Marcotte and some members of his committee, but I've seen a lot of other House members walk in, and maybe if they could just stand and introduce themselves, that would be great. Well, I'll just, right. uh, a number of members of the House Health Care Committee are here, uh, we're going to meet shortly, but uh, uh, Bill Lippert, I'm the chair of the House Health Care Committee. Christy Moore, representative of Springfield, uh, Commerce and Economic Development. Chairman uh, Markov. Ann Donahue, I'm the Vice Chair of the House Health Care Committee. Lori Houghton, House Health Care Committee Ranking Member. David Durfee, I'm also on the Health Care Committee. House Committee. Woody Page, also on the Health Care Committee. Peter Reed, on the Health Care Committee. Brian Chena from Burlington, Health Care Committee. Anne Marie Christensen, Health Care Committee. Charlie Kimball, Woodstock on Commerce. Lucy Rogers, Waterville Health Care Committee. Emily Kornheiser from Brattleboro on Commerce. Stephanie Jerome uh, from Brandon, uh, representing Pittsburgh and Sudbury and on Commerce. Mari Cordes from Lincoln, uh, E.G. Nurse and House <laughs> Well, thank you all so much. I mean, this is uh, very gratifying, I think, to the people on the panel. Such an interest from legislators to try to, and I will apologize, Liz, because I'm probably the most frequent user of the term crisis, because I truly believe that we are a crisis situation. And I'll try to change that tone, because I used to get upset whenever somebody was critical of um, Vermont's economic <coughs> policies, um, because I didn't think that sent a good message. And, and uh, I'll try to process that. But I'm sure I will fail and use the term again because of uh, the dire straits that we're in. Um, I'll start out by throwing a couple of questions. And then just to give the board a heads up, I'm good. I usually start with Robin, so this time I'm mixing it up. I'm going to start with Jess and go this way. Um, but before I start, Catherine, you talked about a number of states that um, focus GMA dollars towards primary care. Um, what is the process? Who determines how GME dollars get spent? So I'm going to have to get back to you with some of the details, but this is, to be clear, specific to the Medicaid GME funding. So that is determined, it's my understanding, by the state itself um, through their Medicaid plans. Medicare functions differently. Um, but we can get you the, I can get you the details on how each state has, the four states that have made that decision, I can get you the information on how each of them um, have made that decision to do so. Super, I appreciate that. Um, and then my next question is for uh, Kathleen. Um, we heard from UVM that 30 Vermonters are in the program. Are there any Vermonters in your program? Yeah, and, and I should have um, said something I meant to say was, uh, an issue none of us talked about is who do we accept into medical school in the first place? 
and, and that's a really key issue. I threw on, had, had thrown on all your desks a copy of Dr. Scott Shipman's article, and anybody who knows health affairs knows that this is the December issue of this year, the entire issue is devoted to rural health. Dr. Shipman is a pediatrician who's on the faculty, but primarily works for the AAMC, and he did this big national study on the declining um, rurality of applicants to medical school. It's, it's really astonishing that um, we are now currently in this country only admitting 5% of our total medical school matriculants. That's, you know, we admit about 16,000 medical students a year. 5% are from rural areas. It's, and it's been a steady state decline for the last 15 years. That's kind of stunning, and, and we could spend a long time, you know, on, and this article is really worth a quick perusal to, to try and get at some understanding of that. But more specifically, um, you know, Dartmouth is a, Geisel is a private medical school. They have never felt that they had any compulsion, as UVM happily does, to make sure they admit students from in-state. Having said that, they have always had a policy of taking Maine, Vermont, and New Hampshire students and keeping them, you know, last year Dartmouth had 6,700 applicants and took 90 students. So the odds are obviously not great, but they have always taken the three northern New England states and put that group in a pool itself. And there are always, they don't have any quotas, despite us working to try and get some, um, but they have always, every year, there's, there's a couple of kids from Maine and a couple of kids from Vermont and a couple of kids from New Hampshire. Uh, so, so it's not a, a clear, nothing like the quarter of your medical students who come from Vermont, but, but certainly there is some attention, at least, to that issue of where do you come from and, and uh, what does that mean about where you might want to be practice long term. So just to continue on that same questions theme, um, been a lifelong Vermont resident, and for years the majority of the doctors in the community that I live actually grew up in that community and came back, and yet for the last few decades we haven't seen any doctors who grew up in the community coming back. Is that a national trend? I think that if you look at this data, I would have to say yes it is. That the, given the, this declining morality of who is applying to and getting into medical school. And, and we might really say that the, we, we have a responsibility to hold our medical schools nationally to task for this substantial change. But there are innumerable factors that include finances and debt and you know all these other issues that we've been discussing. But but the fundamental question is this happening nationally? I I have to say yes it is. Jess. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions. I don't want to take up too much time. There's lots of other board members and people in the public. But I do want to ask, and a couple of you touched on it in your presentations, but as we know Vermont is undergoing pretty significant payment and delivery reform efforts through the all care model. And as I think about it, and you touched on this, uh, you know, with redirecting some money from hospitals into primary care, there's efforts being made to pay for care management, and some of that time that the primary care providers are spending on the phone managing care. There's resources now that are, we've heard from primary care providers, I think Dr. Haddock, we heard from you, because of your uh, participation in the model, the capitation model, you're able to hire a, a, a nurse, uh, that specializes in psychiatric care in your practice, if I remember correctly from the panel earlier, right? So there's more um, support for behavioral health. And I'm, and I'm just wondering, and to some degree, prior offs or lessons through this model, I'm wondering can, how can we leverage some of the innovative things that are happening in Vermont to attract more providers to the state? Um, you know, I hear from providers that they want to get off the fee for service treadmill, that they don't want to be chasing volume all the time. They want to be caring for their patients and they want a payment structure 
that allows them to do so. The all payer model is moving us there. How do we reach out to providers in other states and say, I want to get off the steeper service model. I see what Vermont is doing. Please let me help. How do we do that? And how do we do that? Is that already being done in some of the recruiting efforts that are already being made? <laughs> I mean, yes, is the short answer. Uh, we are focusing on, on that. I, I think that part of the answer, and this is going to be a little more general than perhaps what you're looking for, though, is that sometimes like something seems super duper innovative and then you do it and suddenly you forget that enthusiasm and how really innovative it was that you went there. So now when we talk about the minutia of the budget line by line for one care, I do think we begin to lose track of how exciting it is that we have this model. So part of it is simply how do we talk in Vermont about the bigger goals while we're also dealing with the day-to-day -day of how do we implement this. So that's partially simply a communications thing. I know there's a long, long list of you know, how do we structure it this way and that way and we can continue refining it and we will continue refining it forever. Um, but there is an element of an eye on the prize conversation to have within Vermont about how exciting it is that we have this opportunity. For federally qualified health centers, there are some things that are more specific that matter more to us. So we have a high percentage of our money is tied up in what the federal government allows us to do with it. So the nexus of prior authorization waivers and you know, telehealth option waivers, there's just a whole bunch of stuff that structurally, because we participate in this, we we now don't have to deal with it. We can set up our practices differently. And again, it's an education thing, right? Because we can say, oh yeah, we have all these options, but then you have to sit down with the CEOs of the organizations and say, this is the new world that has now been opened up to you. How do we restructure the practice to match this new payment world? So there's certainly also a one-on-one -on -one there. But I think a lot of it is simply, how do we have the conversation around this throughout Vermont? And, and then we're very good at bragging. So, <laughs> so we can just take that ball and run with it. We're good at bragging, um, but it's part of the, the local conversation as well. It's a great question, and I want to um, address a couple of thoughts that that brought up for me. Um, part of it is that I think it's really challenging to complete that messaging while we're still in transition. Because I think right now for practices, it's actually harder or, or at least as hard because some of your world is maybe capitated and simplified, but you heard Joe say he still has 80 payers he's dealing with. So from an on the ground perspective, a lot of the day to day may be changing for some patients, but not all. And until that's, we continue that transition, which is why we're sort of urging our members, let's stick with this and really see how it plays out. Um, it may not be easier yet, um, but I think we should keep talking about the promise that capitated payments could bring, especially in primary care. I, I'm a little sensitive mentioning this publicly, a piece I keep thinking about and keep talking to physicians about is it also depends if it's translated into how physicians are paid themselves. Because as clinicians are still paid in some systems on a largely what they call RVU, you know, by, by their work basis, it may not, again, make their day-to-day -day life feel different. You know, the practice or the institution could be paying differently, but if they're not changing their physician contracts to reflect that you're paid for keeping a panel of your patients well, but you're paid based on how many visits you get in that day, again, their life may not feel different. So I would encourage all of us as we're having these conversations, let's keep let's keep pushing it so that it does translate into an on the ground day to day difference. I think it has a lot of promise to do so. <laughs> A couple of things I think in the details are important. Um, and as was said here, we're still 60 or 70 percent fee for service. Um, the hospital at the end has the same problem. All their New York people are fee for service, you know, and they get a capitated program for the model. Um, so it's really difficult to do a continuing system. Uh, a detail that I would say has been a real difficulty a real difficult problem for the uh, capitated CPR program is the feds screwed it up pretty badly. And um, in the, the first year, for the first six months, they paid us fever service and capitation, and then they charged us interest to pay them back or, or recoup it in some other way. So it's been a very difficult um, system 
to uh, watch closely. I'm a numbers person. I'm not a business person, but I'm a numbers person. And it makes it hard to get the numbers right. I think that hurt us the first two years, and hopefully they won't do that this year. The other thing I would say is um, the capitation system, at least in primary care, is not for everybody. It depends on your practice. You may have a practice demographic where patients are seen six or seven times a year on average instead of three or four. And so the capitation system as it now exists may not fit well for that program or a style of practice. So I think um, we're in a test time to see if it works or not for some. And I think we're limited to know how well it works because of the way the Medicare screwed up. But also, it'll take a while to see how to adjust it so it fits for more practices than practices that work like alcohol. Ours is not ideal this day. But that's the thing I see the problem. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I think we are very cognizant of the need to achieve scale before we can actually make any assessment of whether this is, you know, uh, we're really seeing the delivery system reform that we want to be able to see. But I, I, I remain optimistic. Can I, um, can I answer that? Oh, one more little. At least, at least immediately, I can tell you that the blueprint for health resources that we use every minute of every day now are, I don't think I could go without it. So, and I think if we looked at the, at the outcomes from that, you know, we have an in-house nutritionist, behavioral health, social work, and a MAC clinician in the building. And so I can offload to patients who, to people that do a great job doing what they do. And I, and I know that Vermont, at least if you were to look at you know, using those math clinicians as spokes. Um, you could look at, from an advertising standpoint, the data in terms of the reduction of, of deaths from opioid use disorder using the primary care docs. So, I mean, just, but I don't think anybody's doing that advertising to talk about it. And it's such an unusual system that the rest of the country's going, you do what? <laughs> we need to do more advertising, perhaps, for some of the innovative things. Yeah. My second question is really, this is my last question, but, you know, I, I'm applauding all the efforts to potentially grow our own by increasing residency potentially or uh, helping to defray costs through loan repayment. Those seem very long-term or potentially medium run to long-term solutions which I think we have to explore. In the short run, you know, I heard um, from Dr. Holman 70 primary care physicians are needed right now, right? So this seems to be a, a short-term uh, concern. And so I'm thinking, are there creative, you know, what are the creative ways that we can think about attracting already trained providers from other states here. And, you know, my first question addresses a little bit of that, but I'm wondering uh, two ways that just occurred to me and occurred to me recently. One is opportunity to attract foreign providers and whether that's been explored enough. Um, I know we've just recently renegotiated trade agreements with, you know, our neighboring bordering countries, Canada, Mexico. You know, are there special visa status that allows us to effectively import workforce to, you know, sort of address the workforce shortage, not crisis, shortage? Um, and you know what efforts are underway to think more globally about recruiting. That was the first one. And then the second version of that is sadly, I think most of us who have been studying the rural health landscape in this country know that there are many communities out there that are have recently decided and more and more to close their community hospitals. Um, last year alone, there are 29 hospitals that went bankrupt and I think another 18 that closed. There are there's a workforce associated with that those hospitals, and th those are individuals who are already trained, who also have already chosen rural health care as their site. And I'm just wondering, not to take advantage of another community's unfortunate, you know, circumstances, but at the same time, these are displaced workers who are now looking for jobs, and they've already chosen, uh, you know, to work in a rural setting. And I'm just wondering, are we thinking differently about how to approach some of those uh, communities or the future workers in this them to come to Vermont and maybe pay them $7,000 as somebody said to come work in Vermont. <laughs> I don't think a lot of those are primary care providers. They may not be. I don't know, but yeah, I don't know enough, you know, about where, you know, but uh, there's certainly nurses in those areas and maybe there's practitioners in those areas, um, hospitalists, I don't know. I'm just wondering. Well, and some of it, you know, some of it does get back to how the state invests in promoting itself broadly for workforce, right? Because all those people are going to, well, not all of them, 
they won't all have partners coming with them, but many of them will have partners coming with them, right? So you really can't divorce it from the overall statewide conversation around economic development. You know, something that I say would love to do, and I, I apologize to the Agency of Commerce and Community Development because I have not told them this yet, but, you know, we would love to work with the state marketing organization to have a message, can we share resources, can we be a fully integrated part of the messaging around Vermont, and Vermont is a great place to come to work. So I think they're indirectly targeting those other rural areas, but you know, there's lots of ways that you, you can address it through through that combination of outreach. And I forget the first half of the question, so no, someone else will answer that. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Jesus. Well, my, I was gonna say talk to Luke Fernandez, but you can. <laughs> I was gonna say talk to John Olson from the Department of Health. Um, I know he participated in the um, Rural Health Task Force, and he was talking about, this is actually something I learned, um, I, Maybe be wrong, I think it's the J-1 visa. There is a category of, um, you know, healthcare visa, uh, visas that healthcare workers can be eligible for that Vermont is apparently not taking advantage of the full number that we have. So I think he has more information about why that may be. I know something that the task force also talked about was um, sort of a resource center or sharing of resources so that hospitals and other healthcare providers that are trying to hire such um, you know, immigrant physicians um, or other healthcare providers can get help navigating that process. I think it's fairly complicated to get that through the pipeline, and so what um, tools and assistance could be available to help that be a smoother path forward. Another thing mentioned on the task force is around looking at um, licensing requirements. Um, I think both for physicians and nurses, other healthcare providers, you know, what possible without lowering, obviously, our you know, standards to protect the public, could there be to simplify translating a degree from some other country to a degree or training in the U.S. Thank you. So could I add a bit to that? There were, um, in our area, we did some work on trying to get international grads, and it, it proved pretty challenging. Most of them uh, were willing to take a job when they could find one in a more urban area, but as soon as they found, you know, that they were completely out of their their universe, rural Vermont, compared to where, you know, the places that they were from, which were by and large much more urban, and um, it, it was just a stepping stone. So it, it didn't work out too well with, uh, with us. Um, but I think the idea of outreach to, um, to doctors where a hospital was closed is a fantastic one. I had not thought about that, but poaching them from elsewhere is not a bad idea. Um, we And the tax credit idea for um, lonely payment would be part of that, but also, um, and this might be something where um, maybe the Commerce Committee, I'm not sure whose purview it is, but outreach to people that are mountain, physicians who are mountain bikers, who are skiers, who have a second home in Vermont, you know, people who are previously trained at UVM and really have that connection to Vermont already might be right candidates for that. Thank you, Lori. Uh, sure. First, uh, thank you very much. It's really very informative. And, you know, I think you really, frames the challenges that we have um, really well. And the solutions seem to be a lot tougher to come by, particularly looking at the number of openings that there are. And you know, it seems that the colleges, when they're, you know, when we talk about, they're kind of, I think Kathleen talked about, they're, you know, almost funded to train a specialist, you know. And so how do we, how do we, A, and I think it's Faye brought up, recruit people who want to go into the family practices and then kind of shift the paradigm on this supply demand where we're getting, you know, the funding at the colleges to be, you know, medically schools to be pushing more towards a family medicine and to, towards, you know, those residencies. So, you know, I don't know what the solutions are, but you, you know, you brought up a lot of issues and, you know, we don't have a lot of time, you know, to, to, to change that shifting. And I think, you know, when you talk about whether loan repayment or not, I mean, clearly money matters. And, you know, I think part of it might be the expectations of people going into medical school. Do they think they're gonna have loan repayment, you know? So maybe it wasn't a top priority because they didn't really go in thinking they would get repaid. And two, you know, we know we have far more specialists coming out than people in the family medicine. So they may go in knowing I'm going to be making half a million or whatever, and I'm going to have a lot of debt, but I'll be able to pay it off. So I, I think there's, you know, it definitely matters in, in some of the choices that are made. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, Catherine, you brought up. 
uh, it sounded like almost thirty million dollars of money that was coming in from the Medicaid reimbursement, and it was equated to like one FTE, and so it's hard to grasp <laughs> that concept of you know if there really is a whole bunch of money coming in, how does that get funded more towards you know, whether it's primary care, family medicine, or, you know, where is that being used? Maybe I was just misinterpreting all the money that would seem to be coming into Vermont and how it's being utilized and how can we, I guess, how can we shift that to where the needs are? So, while I hate to punt, um, because that is Medicaid funding, um, obviously there's a federal match to that, the determinations made are made by the state. And so I would certainly encourage you to find that information. I was honestly surprised when I read that in the GAO report and um, am also curious as to how specifically those decisions are made, um, but they are state level decisions. Okay. Uh, one thing that came this up. One oh, sorry. Uh, 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 yeah, I think that kind of came up that was culture and job satisfaction and you know getting people into to family medicine and you know I don't know how you shift that right but on the corporate world there's there's you know always a lot of different things going on to change the corporate culture and to you know studies that are done and changes and it doesn't seem that on you know medical practice side there's that much change that goes in to do that and certainly with Millennials coming up and different expectations and you know, what they want in workforce, that's going to become a bigger issue. And, you know, I don't know how you shift that either, but you know, job satisfaction is becoming you know, a key thing for people and what they're going to, to go into. You know, so, you do need to shift that piece too. Go ahead, please. So, I just wanted to clarify because I think it's been brought up. I never said money did not matter, <laughs> but it matters less than we sometimes think it matters. There are lots of things that matter that aren't getting attention. Well, that's kind of where I'm going with that, but I knew my remarks might rankle some or be taken out of context, but of course money matters. But along these lines, data tell us that of all of the, the country's medical student graduates in 2019, roughly 16,000, 67% of them graduated from undergraduate experiences without any educational debt. They may have incurred debt for medical school, but they came into medical school without undergraduate debt. That's a really interesting statistic because it tells us something about who is going into medical school. It tells us something about who's being admitted to medical school. Um, it, if we look at first generation college bound students who have gotten an undergraduate degree, that percentage in medical schools across the country is very small. In Vermont, we have a lot of first-generation uh, first generation college bound students. Making the leap from college all the way to medical school is huge, and we're not seeing big numbers there. That's important. That should tell us something about our strategies. That's why I think we really need to back up. This is the long term, the long range, not the short, the short range fix, but the long range. We need to look at what's happening in K through 12 and how those students are being supported through their their um, early education into college and then getting them into uh, health profession training program. <clears throat> so those are the things that I think are important that are not getting the attention due. No, and I, I agree. I don't think the long educator program is necessarily what's going to drive people into you know this field of. Where I met, probably money matters more is probably what they're getting paid for specialists versus in family medicine. And so that's, you know, obviously a big hurdle. And you guys have brought up a couple things. You know, why is there such a differential there? But I think that, you know, just putting them on the payment program isn't necessarily going to attract more without doing a whole bunch of other things. So. If I may, just I want to piggyback off of something that Liz said that I think is really important because, and sort of also, stealing something that uh, Katie said in her remarks, which is that who are we attracting to the field of medicine and to family medicine in particular? Um, there's really good healthcare research out there that shows that a lot of the clinical research we do is focused on the average white male. Practice decisions are also made that way. 
And so when we have providers that look more like the patients they're serving, we actually also get better patient care. So I think that as we think about this discussion, sort of that long range decision about who we're attracting to medicine, it matters not just for the volume of care that can be provided, but also for the quality of care that patients will receive. Hey, Tom. <clears throat> like Marina, I wanna thank you all for um, coming and discussing this. And um, hopefully, you know, out of all of these discussions, uh, some of the sap will turn into syrup and we'll be able to solve these problems over time. Um, one of the issues I want to follow up on too, I want to follow up on Kevin's initial question about this $30 million. I, um, when I first came on the board, I spent some time, I, and looking through EDM's budget, um, I saw that this $30 million is an appropriation of the state, and I'm sure it's appropriated by the legislature in order to make the match legitimate. Um, and the money, I think, goes to the Warner um, Medical School. I mean, so I was just wondering if Krista knew anything about how this money is used there, because um, in looking through the appropriations information uh, in, in the state budget, um, I couldn't find out what it was used for, and I, but I'm sure, I'm certain, it's not $30 million for one FTP. So there's more to this story, and I'm just wondering if you have to know. Yeah, I would have to follow up on that for you. I don't have that information today, but certainly happy to look into it. But it is an issue for legislators. It does go to the state budget. Can I say something? Because in New Hampshire, there is no Medicaid money that comes from GME. And so we have, we have dug into this in great detail. And uh, I sit on the uh, Primary Care Workforce Commission of the state of New Hampshire. And so we've done into this issue quite a bit. And, and the only light I might shed here is I urge you to look hard at New Mexico because they're a national model for a state that took their state appropriated Medicaid money and put it all into, they started five new family medicine residencies in rural parts of New Mexico precisely to address the issue. Uh, and it's quite remarkable when you look at the map of where they, they put them in these very remote parts of New Mexico in order to address specifically the, the, the shortage. So that, that and, and I know in the past that state Medicaid money went to Dartmouth at one time. This is long before my tenure there. And it ultimately, the state voted to stop, set, to stop appropriating it, matching the Medicaid monies, because they were ticked off Right, rightly so, I think fairly, that Dartmouth was not doing anything with it to help support a development of a primary care workforce. Now, it's more complicated than that, and I don't want to oversimplify it, but I do think this is, you've all picked up on it, and I do think it's really worthy of Vermont pursuing how, where is that money coming, coming to, and how is it being utilized, and can it be shifted to help support um, something like new, new family medicine residency development, for example, which costs a couple million dollars, I'll tell you, being in, deep in the midst of, of working to start one in New Hampshire, that, you know, they don't just make themselves overnight. When you look at uh, what uh, Benton has proposed, the numbers are pretty staggering. And we begin to wonder if there isn't another way to try to get those doctors here that might be less expensive because it is so expensive to start that residency program. My next question uh, has to do with one here in the ACO. Um, uh, I, I, um, this is kind of like my broad thought that uh, Vermont has more than 30 years of worth of struggling with health care reform going back to you know, Ralph Wright and Howard Dean and Cheryl Rivers in the legislature in the early 90s for a single payer system and that kind of recycling again um, more recently, and then you have the free market types, the invisible hand will, will solve our problems. And I somehow feel that that uh, one care um, is is in the middle of that. It's a replacement, it's the connective tissue that people are looking forward, looking for to kind of connect the system better and make it more efficient and help people get healthier. Uh, but it's not the full um, uh, panoply of uh, of, of government oversight and, and, and intervention. Um, I'm sensing from listening to <coughs> all of you who spoke to uh, about uh, the ACO and what care, that you're generally in favor of this experiment. I mean, it is a test, it is experiment, 
uh, that the federal government has made available to us. It's uh, involved, I, I can follow the numbers of the ACO from a budget perspective, and money is walking toward the ACO, not away from it. It is growing in leaps and bounds. Some people have misinterpreted what that money is, um, um, unfortunately. So I'm, I'm just asking, our, you know, if, if I can, if my sense is correct, that you folks generally feel who are on the front lines of health care in Vermont, that one care in the ACO is, is, is a good place for us to go. Um, I think so. I don't think anybody knows for sure. Uh, I'm on the board. I will say, looking at the ACO budget, for me, is a nightmare. And I'm sure you all look at it more closely than I do. I will say my uh, involvement, old, um, is that my goal is to preserve primary care. And I admit that's very provincial and small, but it's my feeling that if we preserve primary care, some method of health care reform may succeed. So my goal of looking at the ACO, what does it uh, do to preserve primary care? Now that may be too narrow, but from my point of view, and being in the middle of it, um, I think it's worth a try. I don't know that it'll work, um, but I think, and I think five years is too short to find out, and I'm so old, I won't be around when you find out anything, but I think it's worth a try. I would say there's a lot of uh, paranoia and thoughts about Machiavelli and goals and things like that. Um, my experience with them, and I don't belong to UVM or anything else, and I applaud the bigger, <laughs> but um, my experience is the people running it firmly believe that this is the way to go, and they're trying hard to do so. Whether they're right or not, I don't know, but I think their, their goals are uh, correct, and uh, their um, intent is correct. Whether it works or not, I don't know. So I think it's worth a try from my point of view. Does anyone on the panel have a contrarian point of view? I, I don't want to be um, qualified as contrarian before <laughs> and then pick up the mic. This isn't really contrarian, but it, um, outside, we're outside the ACO, we're a federally qualified health center, we're not members of it. It's. From a distance, it's very hard for me to imagine the money flowing through this entity that is so closely wedded to the tertiary care center and really having faith that primary care is going to be their goal and that they're going to be able to make the substantive changes that will need to be made at the tertiary care level in order for primary care to flourish. I don't, I, I haven't negotiated with them. I don't, I've never looked at a contract. I don't know what any of it is about, but just from the thousand foot view in the trenches in a town of 350 people in primary care, it's hard for me to imagine a system where the money flows through the tertiary care center. So I should say my dad is the vice chair of her board. Um, <laughs> And we at the family dinner table lay out the communications challenges in exactly what Dr. Homan has just described, right? So, so I'm paid to explain these things. My father looks at me blankly. Um, so, you know, and, and that's part of the problem to what Dr. Haddock was saying as well. You know, I come from, as I said, an agricultural policy background, right? So the I, and we talk about generational change and investing in things, you know, when you look at food and health, right, you're changing things by generation of how we eat and how we interact with healthy food. To be asked to see turnarounds on a quarterly basis or a one-year basis is just anathema to me. I can't even get my mind around that. So giving providers on the ground and FQHCs the tools to build that bridge from generational change to what am I going to do tomorrow is a really challenging thing that we all need to work together to navigate. And I've uh, complained uh, in the past about how the communications have worked, but it's not just on one care, just on any one entity to do it. It's on all of us to have those really constructive and structured conversations to navigate this path forward. 
my final question is uh, <clears throat> for Elizabeth. I'm I'm looking at your slide 17, which is your 2020 loan repayment program applications, and I'm just wondering in uh, you know in looking at the numbers here. Um, do you have any kind of sense as who holds those loans? I'm sure you do. Who holds those loans and what the interest rates? But you know, is there usury there or are these interest rates you know, for, from people that hold them, you know, that are being collected by those that hold the loan reasonable? So we do have that data. I don't know it off the top of my head, but many of the loans that are federally subsidized loans and they are held by the direct student lender program at different servicing organizations all across the country. We do verify educational debt, so we have that information in our office. We, we verify debt amounts, um, and we verify that they're educational loan programs and not private loans and that sort of thing. So we have a lot of data on this, um, but there are some loans with higher or some interest rates that are higher than others for sure there's some variability especially if they are private educational loans again i don't know those numbers off the top of my head but well, if you can just get a summary of that i'd be interested in that certainly thank you okay Robin. thank you thank you all for spending the afternoon with us uh, to talk about primary care workforce as i think you all or most of you know i chaired the rural health services task force this past summer and fall. So I've been thinking a lot about the workforce issues across our entire healthcare system um, lately. And I think, I just, I don't really have a question. I wanted to just kind of pull out some themes um, that I felt like I heard from a number of you, including uh, the need for short, medium, and long-term strategies. We have um, some alarming statistics uh, certainly in the primary care area with 70 physician vacancies. In the nursing area, it's 5,000 vacancies in 2020. So across our entire healthcare spectrum, the vacancies are, uh, are alarming, you know, quite frankly, not to get into the crisis mode, but you know, it, we, and we're not gonna necessarily be able to solve that tomorrow. Um, so we need to be moving forward and planning in a thoughtful way. Um, Liz, I was glad you mentioned strategic plan because there is a workforce strategic plan from 2013 that is in need of being updated. That's an area that we have pushed on AHS uh, about in the past, and I think it might be time to do that again. Uh, one of the recommendations in the Rural Health Services Task Force was for the Department of Labor to prioritize healthcare workforce um, because they do have some prioritization among sectors, and given sort of the magnitude of the problem, um, I think the task force would, would love to see uh, healthcare rise as a higher priority in the, in the Department of Labor uh, strategies. Um, and so I think, I think that um, I'm really hopeful that we will see movement at the legislature this session across a number of different sectors on the workforce area, issues and areas. And there is a lot of consensus among, in the healthcare community in general in terms of strategies uh, for moving forward. So uh, I think that consensus will be helpful in terms of providing the legislature with areas that are maybe more actionable in a shorter period of time. So that's. Uh, few things I wanted to bring out. Thank you, Robin. So at this point, we'll open it up to the public. Yes, Deb. Could you bring Hi. me a piece of fruit? Uh, yes, I have an app for you. <laughs> I swear. But you were on Canva. I, I already recognized you. Okay, sorry. Oh, okay. I recognize you next. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Deb Richter, I'm a family physician and a happy family physician, actually in rural Vermont, Cam Cambridge. Um, people from elsewhere don't know where that is, but we have, um, again, an independent practice. We're not part of the ACO. Um, and I think one of the reasons, I, oddly enough, that we're very happy there is we have paper charts. Um, you know, it's, I spend two and a half hours a day charting, calling patients back, and I finish. And I don't ever do things on the weekend unless I'm on call, or I have to go in every, you know, every eight weeks on a Saturday. Um, so I think, you know, that we need to look at some of the factors that I feel that's really, when I first went into medicine, that was sort of the conditions of practice. 
Um, and, and I think one of the other things, though, that, that I'm unhappy about is the fact that my patients do not have equal protection in terms of their coverage. Some of them have up to $12,000 deductibles, which of course changes the way I'm able to care for them. And one, we did a survey a, a few years ago where um, we looked at what would happen if we had a single payer in Vermont. And we did a national survey, and 200 doctors said they'd move here. 60 of them were primary care if we had a single payer. So let's do it on a smaller scale and make universal primary care, including mental health and substance abuse services, free for all Vermonters. It's a small price tag for a huge benefit, as we all have been saying. This is the most important sector in care, and it's as Katie Marvin was saying. It's important that every patient be covered. So I think we could attract, if we said, all of your patients are covered, same coverage. We could do risk-adjusted capitated payments, reduce the amount of administrative burden of billing and all that other stuff, which would increase our productivity. We could probably see more patients if we didn't have as much paperwork. I can't help you guys who have electronic records. I'm sorry. But, <laughs> but um, and, I, and again, I'm not against electronic records, except we all know the real reason that we're having problems is the really more about maximizing reimbursement, not about documenting what we're doing for our colleagues and for ourselves and our future visits. The other thing is, the other reason I'm a happy doctor is I'm seeing patients that I saw 20 years ago. I tell them, do you know what you weighed when you were two months old? They're now 20. I have it right here in this paper record. And so the fact that I, they've known me, I mean, now I'm dealing, uh, sadly enough, some of them have now addiction problems. I dealt with them. I took care of them when they were babies. That continuity is what Faye was talking about, is one of the reasons we love what we do is the relationship. No one's talked about that. It's about the relationship we have with our patients. I guess you did, Faye, I'm sorry. That is another reason I'm a happy doctor. And I think that's something that we need to, again, we can, we can emphasize. Um, I, I, again, I would say H129 would give us universal primary care, which I think would be a great recruiting tool to get people to want to practice in the state of Vermont, simplify it, and all our patients would be covered. As far as a federal, a national thing, um, you might want to ask Sen Senator Sanders to maybe introduce something. We did a back of the napkin, and what it would cost to fully fund medical education, this was years ago, $4 billion. Sounds like a lot. So let's do half of the students and say, we're going to fully fund your medical education, but you have to go into primary care and stay in primary care. Um, fully funded for $2 billion. That's chump change. That's a rounding error in national terms. That's nothing. I mean, we could maybe take some of Trump's wall. That was, what, $6.7 billion. And, and fully fund medical education for <coughs> half of, of the students. <coughs> Thank you, Jeff. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Representative Jim Grove. Um, and I wanted to tell you about a bill that uh, I introduced last session, and it's H-374, and it goes right to the heart of what we've been talking about. And that would cover uh, five critical air shortages that we have in the state. Physicians, physicians' assistants, nurses, teachers, and police officers. And the way the bill that would, would work, essentially, is what I call a two-for-one. For every year of medical school or nursing school that uh, the state would cover, we would get a two-year commitment. So theoretically, for nurses and teachers, we get 12 years. And the belief is that after those 12 years, we work, I'm confident, that uh, those folks are going to settle down, become property taxpayers, payroll taxpayers, buy homes, and become Vermonters, which is what the governor has talked about in his inaugural address. He said, we need people. We need property tax. That's what we're desperately sure of. I spoke with the president of UVM last week um, to talk about perhaps partnering with UVM with respect to the cost, particularly of uh, doctors and nurses uh, through scholarships, with the intention that those doctors, nurses, teachers, police officers, physicians, assistants would have to commit to living in Vermont, and they would go where they would need it, not where they wanted. So we need Chittenden Center. But I wanted, I think that's it in a nutshell. In addition to that, you know, this would be a very expensive program. So during the course of uh, the loan repayment, whomever was uh, eligible for this program would have to make their student loan payment. 
So at the end of the, the two year, the first two year commitments, they would be reimbursed. So it wouldn't just be open in the floodgate. Uh, finally, what I'd like to convey to you or ask for and uh, your assistance is that if we included uh, the state colleges and local private colleges to participate uh, in uh, this sort of uh, program so that it's spread out. I think if we were to do that, it would become a, a recruitment tool uh, for the, the private colleges, state colleges, and the university to, get, to be able to tell the, those students in those five critical areas that you know, we're not gonna have any student longer. And I think it would, it would foster uh, a sense of competition that would bring the best into those programs. And they would have the confidence of knowing that at the end of their, their, uh, their education, there's no doubt. That's it. Thank you. Sure. Yes. I'm not an advocate. I'm kind of like North Carolina Medical Center. There were two things, and since I think most of the topic was supposed to be around recruiting and retention, um, one of the things that I didn't hear um, discussed was uh, the percentage of positions regardless that will be employees and so then as an employer how are you reducing the barriers or increasing the capacity to hire um, the other has to do with the pressure of the day um, around EMRs I think the literature regardless of what you want that has added more work but also um, the reimbursement and capture of the total work effort um, in, even by CMS, I mean, we're, we're partnered with CMS on labor, but they've yet to really um, value the work effort and move to a value-based system around care coordination, patient-centered medical home, that if those work values were reevaluated, that would help bridge that gap of reimbursement um, where you have a primary care physician that used to could see 22 or 25 uh, patients and feel like they had a good day, they, just, they now struggle to see 14. And that unfortunately is translating to either loss on the fee for service side or yet that we, we haven't hit upon the, the correct ratio even within the ACO environment um, to pay for primary care. Um, the second with, with respect to um, uh, attracting primary care or any physician to the state um, hospitals are disincentivized to make the provider tax to be an employer. I mean, for MNC, I mean, we I don't write a check about half a million dollars a month um, for the primary care and, and physicians that we employ. And I could add two and a half more primary care physicians in my community where we had a desperate need if it didn't go to the provider tax. So I think that when you're looking at attraction to the state, um, you have to look at also the barriers for either a private practice to expand their roles and take on the risk of a new provider coming into the area, but then also the hospitals who, through the collective air, um, uh, triple aim, really need to drive um, or at least be strong partners with primary care within the curve on the use of specialists. So um, curious, since we have someone, uh, a senator's representative here, um, around that valuation, and is there discussion um, with CMS around the work value unit in primary care to help drive or reduce the discrepancy between what a primary care physician can make versus a, a specialist? Well, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, not at all. Um, so, hmm. I would say that that is worth a discussion with CMS and in the Senator's office, we would be happy to help connect you with CMS for that conversation. Um, we do not have influence over the decisions they make on work values and how they determine that. Um, but I do think what you raised is an important discussion around particularly within the frame of the ACO. We certainly know that a significant amount of funding comes from CMS, passes through the ACO and back out to providers. And so looking at how that valuation is determined is an important piece of making that investment in primary care. Because if what is happening is using claims that are just a quarter or a year old that are all based in a fee-for-service environment, and that's 
those are the data with which we are making determinations around the next set of payments. Are we really transitioning to a value-based care system or are we doing fee-for-service under a different name? So we would be happy to help you connect to CMS and have that conversation um, to the extent that we can serve um, as your federal partner. Joe, I was just interested in the first part of your question, whether you would hire for the hospital or you become independent. And uh, it's a real difficult time in this generation. Young physicians see being employed by some outfit as security. And older physicians, especially as real old, uh, see security as having somebody else not tell you what to do. And, do it. and uh, that's a real generational gap. But it's well shown in many studies that as soon as a physician goes to work for a hospital, the cost of care goes up. And that's shown numerous times. Um, so I don't, we had a terrible time trying to recruit versus the hospital, over the medical school, and uh, some difficulty recruiting with SQHCs because of better loan payment plan. Um, so I don't know how you do that, but it is a difficult situation. Other members of the public. Hi. Hi, um, Mike Markovich here at House Commerce. Um, I think Dr. Morrow, you brought something up that was really interesting to me. The biases of, um, of educators moving students into certain areas. And it's something that, that we have been looking at over the last few years on high school level mm -hmm. with guidance counselors always trying to push kids into college when technical education is probably better for them or just as well for them where their student debt is generally zero. And so I, I, I found that interesting that, that even those biases within the medical education field uh, operate as well. And it's it's just how we, we should let the students make the decisions of where they want to be and not try to influence them to a certain path. So I found that really interesting that I think throughout maybe education we have those biases. Yeah, it, you know, you bring to mind this funny thing that happened to me this week, which was I was asked to do some women's health teaching for the uh, physician's assistants, um, Franklin Pierce University, one of the private. Um, and I said, sure, I would. I, I love teaching that stuff. And they said, we'll, we'll pay you 100 bucks an hour. And I said, gee, great, you know, I don't. And, and I, the same day, I got a bill for my plumber. And the, and the labor rate for, for my plumber was 100 bucks an hour. And I thought, hallelujah. <laughs> you know, we, because really, when you think about skills and all that it takes to get there, plumbers are pretty darn important. It's just a funny uh, uh, little anecdote there. But I, but I think, you know, this comes down to culture. We all care deeply about what we do, and, and we're human beings, and we, we can't help but um, be influenced by Rupert Fay and I, the three of us will all say exactly the same things about the wonders of the work of family medicine, continuity and, and relationship over time and commitment to communities and being embedded in communities and how meaningful that is and you know we could go on and on and on about that. But you know, the cardiologists feel that way about their work and the surgeons feel that way about their work and, and so people are naturally passionate about what they've devoted their life to. And so, humanly, we, we see all these bright, remarkably bright young people come to us, and of course we're, we're all interested in, in helping influence them and finding the right niche. And none of us would, would disagree with the notion that you know, primary care generalism is not for everybody. It is, it is not the right work for all people. It would be awful if everybody was forced into primary care. Um, that's, that doesn't make any sense. But helping make sure, ensure that we accept into training in the first place the kinds of people who are going to evenly distribute themselves across all our needs is, is really 
part of our responsibility. I think all of our responsibility. And I, I want to say another thing about the, the interdependency of our specialties here. But, you know, I, I applaud us for spending this much time focused on primary care. But I have conversations on a regular basis with my colleagues in surgery, in OBGYN, and in psychiatry about the demise of generalism across those specialties. And these are the impending crises beyond primary care is the, the got to be our first line of attack because we're broad spectrumly trained and can do the majority of care. But boy, let's not forget, we've got real crises coming in general surgery. You know, you, you have to travel long distances now to get your appendix out. And that can be a tough thing in the middle of the night. OBGYN has become a subspecialty specialty. Everybody subspecialized. There's a decreasing number of generalists in OBGYN. And of course, I don't have to tell you anything about the problem of psychiatry. So we're, I, I always want to remember that we're all in this together. And this, this issue is a broad issue, really, across the medical spectrum. Primary care is looming the hardest in front of us, and I do believe is the one we have to focus on for solving first and foremost, but, but not far, far behind are, are some of these other specialty ones. Yeah, you know, I want to thank you for making me look uh, introspectively at myself because uh, I had a plumber at my house. When I got the bill, my response wasn't hallelujah. <laughs> Yes. Yes, you have. Um, I'm Grace Solomon. I'm a third year at Geisel, actually. Um, and I just had my family medicine rotation with Dr. Hellman um, at the Little Rivers Clinic. I had a wonderful time. Um, I always knew I would want to do primary care, but uh, family medicine just wasn't quite on my radar. I didn't have a lot of exposure to it. As you mentioned, especially in preclinical years, we just don't get a lot of um, education on what it means to go into primary care. The culture is kind of set around us thinking you're dealing with a lot of chronic conditions, you're just treating diabetes and hypertension, which doesn't sound as alluring as someone saying like, oh, we have a stroke victim here and we have to manage that quickly. Um, and other more quote unquote fast paced specialties. So I think for our preclinical culture, um, our lecturers are usually specialists, and um, the cardiologists come teach us about cardiovascular system, things like that. So having family med docs or people in primary care in general just come give some of those lectures, I think would be awesome because we end up really admiring the knowledge and confidence and experience of all the doctors who come in to teach us those things. Um, and they should be compensated for that time, too, and represented as much as the other more um, specialized doctors. So, Grace, you're coming with me to my next dean's meeting. <laughs> <laughs> other public comment? Yes. I'm uh, Rob Penny. I'm a family physician, and I'm on the primary care advisory group as well. Um, I, I would just like to make a, um, a plea for keeping the term crisis in the discussion. It may not be a good marketing tool, but maybe it's a good motivational tool for those that have to make decisions. You've heard a lot of good suggestions here. Um, uh, in the last few weeks, I was cleaning out a closet. I mostly retired, so I have time to do that now. And came a lot, across a lot of newspaper clippings and things that I had and others had read, written around 2008, 2009, when there was some interest in nationally and locally about healthcare reform. Um, they're all very applicable today. I could spread them around, you'd think they were written today. The same problems were there, particularly with primary care, the under reimbursement, the bureaucratic burden, um, the hassles, and the medical debt, you know, they've gotten worse. You know, 10 years earlier they were there. Um, I've been around for a while. I'm one of those over 60 people, I'm sorry. Um, but things need to be done this year, next year, significant things, or we'll 
some of you will maybe be sitting here 10 years from now hearing the same stories, but again, worse. Um, so it's, it's, it's a crisis, and you've heard a lot of the you know, deficiencies we have in the primary care, and particularly failing medicine work, workforce. So I'm, I'm going to make a plea, you know, looking back on the history and, and fearfully on the future, um, that things need to be done this year, next year, and then follow through, because everything that's been mentioned, if it was implemented, there'd still be more to do. So keep crisis in there somewhere <laughs> in the discussion. I'm sure I probably will. <laughs> uh, I do want to tell you, uh, Rob, that uh, a year ago while I was um, in my morning commute to Montpelier, uh, a DJ was talking about finding a pamphlet from 1931. And it was about the biggest issues of that time. And in that, he started reading some of the, the uh, chapters in that pamphlet sustainability of education, sustainability of health care. These are issues that don't go away, that we will continue to uh, deal with as, as a society. And uh, we make incremental change, and that's the best that we can really hope for. Um, other members of the public, if not seeing none, I really, what, what did I miss? Walter. Oh, Walter, I'm sorry. I think we could do uh, bigger change if we wanted to trouble is we don't want to. Um, and for the primary care docs here, I know as a patient, I've been through five of them in probably eight or nine years with the practice I've been visiting because they all leave. They get so sick of the everything you've mentioned here. Just They get so sick and they just go, you know, hop, whatever, wherever they go, they go. I've been through with one for three years now. And he's been talking about it, so I'm going to have to find him. Probably have to find another one somewhere. And this is in a rural, semi-rural practice, so that's another thing. You know, again, you go to an office, and you're lucky if you get five minutes, maybe ten minutes, with that primary care doc because the crunch is on numbers. It's not on specifically care; it's on numbers, numbers, numbers. You know accounts receivable, billing, that kind of thing. And we have to really change the culture. Um, as one British person said last night at a healthcare hearing, we have to stop thinking about it as an insurance program, but as a human right. Thank you. Mike. You're right in that. Seeing no other public comment, is there any uh, New business to come before the board? Is there any old business to come before the board? Seeing none, I really wish to uh, thank the panel. Uh, especially want to do a big shout out to um, the doctors who have spent their day here. I know it's going to be a long day because there's a primary care advisory group meeting tonight starting at 5. Um, but it shows the passion that you have for your field. And as Dr. Holmes always reminds us of opportunity costs or lost costs. Um, you certainly had some today by being here, and on behalf of everyone in Vermont, I wish to thank you for making the choice to try to make a difference. So thank you. With that, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day.